Chapter One of the Purple Flame. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. Chapter One The Mystery of the Old Dredge. Marion Norton started, took one step backward, then stood staring startled by this sudden action the spotted reindeer behind her lunged backward to blunder into the brown one that followed him and this one was in turn thrown against a white one that followed the two this set all three of them into such a general mix-up that it was a full minute before the girl could get them quieted and could again allow her eyes to seek the object of her alarm as she stood there her pulse quickened her cheeks flushed and she felt an all but irresistible desire to turn and flee yet she held her ground had she seen a flash of purple flame she had thought so it had appeared to shoot out from the side of the dark bulk that lay just before her might have been my nerves she told herself perhaps my eyes are seeing things twouldn't be strange i came a long way today she had come a long way over the arctic tundra that day starting but two minutes before from her reindeer herd close to a hundred miles from nome alaska she had covered fully two-thirds of that distance in two days her way had led her over low hills across streams whose waters ran clear and cold toward the sea down broad stretches of tundra whose soft mosses had oozed moisture at her every step here a young widgeon duck ready to begin his southward flight for this was the arctic's autumn time had stretched his long neck to stare at her here a mother white fox had yap yapped at her insolently and unafraid here she had paused to pick a handful of pink salmon berries or to admire a particularly brilliant array of wild flowers which but for her passing might never have been born to blush unseen and waste their fragrance on the desert air Yet always with the three reindeers at her heels she had pressed onward toward Nome the port and metropolis of all that vast north country The black bulk that loomed out of the darkness before her was a deserted dredging scow grounded on a sandbar of the Sinrock River at least she had thought the scow deserted until now she had believed and hoped that here she might spend the night completing her journey on the morrow but now she breathed yes yes there can be no mistake there it is again sinking wearily down upon the damp grass she buried her face in her hands she was so tired she could cry yet she must mush on through the dark over the soft oozing tundra for fifteen more weary miles fifteen miles further down the river was the sinrock mission here she might hope to find a corral for her deer and food and rest for herself marian did not cry born and bred in the arctic she was made of such stern stuff as the arctic wilderness and the arctic blizzard alone can mould she did not mean to take chances with the occupants of the old dredge there was something mysterious and uncanny about that purple flame which she now saw shoot straight out a full two feet to instantly disappear she had seen nothing like it before in the arctic as she studied the outlines of the dredge she realized that the light was within it that it flashed across a small square window in the side of the old scow no she reasoned i can't afford to take chances with them i must go on down the river i can make sinrock speaking to her reindeer she tugged at their lead straps one at a time they started forward until at last they again took up the weary swish swish across the tundra once marian turned to look back again she caught the flash of a purple flame had she known how this purple flame was to be mixed up with her own destiny she might have paused to look longer as it was she gave herself over to wondering what sort of people would take up their habitation in that half tumbled down dredge and what their weird light might signify she had heard of the strange rites performed by those interesting child people the eskimos in the worship of the spirits of dead animals for one of these 
the bladder festival they saved all the bladders of polar bears walrus and seals which they had killed and at last after four days of ceremony committed them again to the waters of the ocean they burn wild parsnip stalks at that festival marian mused but that purple flame was not made by burning weeds it was the brilliant flame of a blue hot furnace flaring up or something like that probably wasn't eskimo at all probably well it may be some orientals who have stolen away up here to worship their idols by burning strange fires she thought of all the foreign people who had crossed the pacific to take up their homes in the far north city of nome which was just forty miles away japanese chinese koreans russians and members of nameless tribes she whispered to herself as if half afraid they might hear her might be any of these might suddenly she broke off her thinking and stopped short just before her a form loomed out of the dark another and yet another appeared for a moment she stood there rigid scarcely breathing then she threw back her head and laughed reindeer she exclaimed i was frightened by some reindeer oh well she said and after a moment's reflection i might excuse myself for that i'm tired out and marching over this soggy tundra besides i guess that purple flame got on my nerves all the same she avowed stoutly i'll solve that mystery yet see if i don't there for the time the subject was dismissed the presence of these few reindeer before her told her of more not far away a whole herd of them where there were reindeer there would be herders and herders lived in tents here there would be a warm dry place to rest and sleep must be the sinrock herd she concluded in this she was right soon off in the distance she caught the yellow glow of candlelight shining through a tent wall Fifteen minutes later she was seated upon a rolled-up sleeping bag Chatting gaily with two black-eyed Eskimo girls who were keeping their brothers tents while those worthies were out looking for some stray fawns After her three reindeers had been relieved of their packs and set free to graze Marian had dined on hardtack and juicy reindeer chops Then she crawled deep down into her soft reindeer skin sleeping bag to snatch a few hours of rest before resuming her journey to Nome before her eyelids closed in sleep her tireless brain went over the problem before her and the purpose of her fatiguing journey She had come all this way to meet a relative whom she had never seen a cousin Patsy Martin from Louisville, Kentucky Kentucky she whispered the word for the hundredth time way down south Imagine a girl who was brought up there coming here for a winter to endure our cold snow and blizzards She's probably slim willowy and tender as a baby dresses in thin silks and all that Why did father send her up here? Looks like it was bad enough to have 400 reindeer to herd without having a 16 year old cousin from Kentucky To look after She yawned sleepily yet her mind went on thinking of her reindeer herd and her problems Though she had lived all but one year of her life in the far north she had never until two months before spent a single night in a reindeer herders camp But it was no longer a novel experience Until recently her father had been a prosperous merchant in Nome Financial reverses had come and he had been obliged to sell his store The reindeer herd which he had taken as payment for a debt was the only wealth he had saved from the crash Following this his doctor had ordered him to leave the rigorous climate of the north and to seek renewed health in the States Much as he regretted it He had been obliged to ask his daughter to give up her studies and to take charge of the herd until a favorable opportunity came for selling it and That won't be too soon. I guess Marion sighed reindeer herds are a drug on the market trouble is it's too hard to dispose of the meat and if you can't sell reindeer meat you can't make any money now added to this comes this cousin patsy martin her father had written that patsy was given to overstudy and that mr martin her uncle thinking that a year in the northern wilds would do her good had asked permission to send her up to be with marion marion's father had consented and patsy was due on the next boat 
She'll be company for you, her father had written. I do wonder if she will, Marian sighed again. Oh, well, no use to be a pessimist. And at that she turned over and fell asleep. It was a surprise, Marian, who three days later found herself caught in the firm embrace of her cousin, Patsy. Patsy was two years younger than Marian. There could be no missing the fact that she was much slimmer and more graceful, and that there was strength in her slender arms was testified to by her warm embrace. When at last Marian got a look at Patsy's face, she found it almost as brown as her own. And as for freckles, there could scarcely have been a greater number on one person's face. Her mouth, too, had lines that Marian liked. It was a firm, determined little mouth that said, When I have a hill to climb, I run up it. Never had Marian beheld such a wealth of colour as was displayed in Patsy's winter wardrobe. Orange and red sweaters, great broad scarves of mixed greys, gay tams, short plaid skirts, heavy brown corduroy knickers, these and many other garments of exquisite workmanship and design were spread out before her. And the fun of it all is, giggled Patsy, we're going to play we're twins and wear one another's clothes. You've got a spotted fawnish parka, I know you have. I am going to wear that right away, this afternoon, going to have my picture taken in it and send it back to my school friends. All right, agreed Marian. You can have anything I own. I'm heavier than you are, but Arctic clothing doesn't fit very tight, so I guess it will be all right. As if to clinch the bargain, she wound an orange-coloured scarf around her neck and went strutting across the room. A half hour later, while Patsy was out having her picture taken, Marian walked slowly up and down the room. She was thinking, and her thoughts were long, long thoughts. I like her, she said at last. I'm going to like her more and more. But it's going to be hard for her sometimes, fearfully hard. When the blizzards sweep in from the north and we're all shut in, when no one comes and no one goes, and the nights are twenty hours long, when the dogs howl their lonesome song, it's going to be hard for her then. But I'll do the best I can for her. Her father was right. It will do her a world of good. It will teach her the slow and steady patience of those who live in the north, and that's a good thing to know. Three weeks later, the two girls, toiling wearily along after two reindeer sleds, approached the black bulk of the old scow in the river, the one in which Marion had seen the mysterious purple flame. Again it was night. They were on their way north to the reindeer herd. Travelling over the first soft snow of winter, they had made twenty miles that day. For the last hour, Patsy had not uttered a single word. She had tramped doggedly after the sled, only her drooping shoulders told how weary she was. Marion had hoped against hope that they would this time find the old dredge deserted. It would make a nice dry place to camp, she said to herself, as she brought her reindeer to a halt and stood studying the dark bulk. Patsy dropped wearily down upon the loaded sled. Just as Marion was about to give the word to go forward, there flashed across the square window a jet of purple flame. Oh! exclaimed Marian. What is it? asked Patsy. The purple flame. The purple flame? What's that? You know as much as I do. Only I know it's there in that old dredge. And since it's there, we can't stop here for the night. We must go on. Oh, but, but I can't, Patsy half sobbed. You don't know, you can't know how tired I am. Yes, I know, said Marian softly. I've been just that way, but we dare not stop here. The people in the old scow might have dogs and they would attack our reindeers. We must go on five miles more and then camp beneath the stars. All right, said Patsy with a burst of determination. Let's get it over quick. Again they moved slowly forward, but neither of them forgot the purple flame. Three times they saw it flash across the window. That place must be haunted, Marian sighed as she turned to give her full attention to the lagging reindeer. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of the Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson.
Patsy from Kentucky Some five miles from the old dredge, Marion stopped her reindeer, gazed about her for a moment, then said quietly, We'll camp here. Here? cried Patsy. Won't we freeze? Freeze? No, we'll be safe as a bug in a rug. Just you sit down on a sled until I unpack this one. After that, I'll pick it out the reindeer and get supper. From the sled, Marion dragged a sheet iron affair, which she called a Yukon stove. With dry moss dug from beneath the snow, and wood brought on the sled, she kindled a fire. They had no shelter, but the glow of the fire cheered Patsy immeasurably. When the smell of frying bacon and warming red beans reached her, she was ready to execute a little dance of joy. Supper over, Marion took a small trench shovel, salvaged by a friend from the Great War, and scraped away the snow from above the soft, dry tundra moss. Over this cleared space, she spread a square of canvas. Then, untying a thong about a deerskin sleeping bag, she allowed the bag to slowly unroll itself along the canvas. There, she announced, the bed is made. No need to pull down the shades. We'll get off our outer garments and hop right in. Patsy looked at her in astonishment. Then, seeing her take off first her mackinaw, then her sweater, she followed suit. Now, said Marion, as they reached the proper stage of disrobing, you do it like this. Sitting down upon the canvas, she thrust her feet into the sleeping bag, then began to work her way in. Come on, she directed. We can do it best together. It's just big enough for two. I had it made that way on purpose. Patsy dropped to the place beside her. Then together they burrowed their way into the depths of the bag until only their eyes and noses were uncovered. How soft, murmured Patsy as she wound an arm about her cousin's neck, then lay staring up at the stars. How warm, she whispered again five minutes later. Yes, Marion whispered, as though they were sleeping at home and might disturb the household by speaking aloud. You see, this bag is made of the long-haired winter skins of reindeer, the hair is a solid mat more than an inch thick. The skin keeps out the wind. With the foot and the sides of it sewed up tight, you can't possibly get cold, even if you sleep on the frozen ground. How wonderful, exclaimed Patsy. It wouldn't be a bit of use writing that to my friends. They simply wouldn't believe it. No, they wouldn't. For a little time, with arms twined about one another, the cousins lay there in silence. Each, busy with her own thoughts, was not at all conscious of the bonds of human affection which the vast silence of the white wilderness was even now weaving about them. Bonds far stronger than their arms about one another's necks, these were to carry them together through many a wild and mysterious adventure. As if in anticipation of all this, Patsy snuggled a bit closer to Marion and said, I think this is going to be great. Let's hope so, Marion answered. And will we really herd the reindeer? No, laughed Marion, at least not any more than we wish to. You see, we have three Eskimo herders with us, and Atatak, a girl who cooks for them, they do most of the work. All we have to do is to finance the herd and sort of supervise it. You see, the Eskimo people are really child people. They have had many strange customs in the past that don't fit now. In their old village life of hunting and fishing, it was an unwritten law that if one man had food and another had none, it must be shared. That won't work now. There is only one time of a year that we can get food into this herding ground. That is summer. We freight it up the river and store it for winter's use. That gives us a big supply of provisions in the fall. There are two Eskimo villages thirty miles away. If there were no white people about, our good-hearted herders would share our supplies with the villagers as often as they came around. Before the winter was half through, they would be out of supplies. They would then have to live on reindeer meat, and that would be hard on our herd. In fact, we would soon have no herd. So that is the reason we are going to spend a winter on the tundra. And will we live like this? asked Patsy. Oh, no, laughed Marion. We have tents for this time of year. In a month we will move into the most interesting houses you ever saw. We'll reserve that as a surprise for you. Oh, oh, sighed Patsy, as she suddenly became conscious of the aches in her legs. I think it's going to be grand. 
if only I get so I can stand the travel as you do. Do you think I ever will? Of course you will, in less than a week. You know, said Patsy thoughtfully, down where I came from, we think we exercise an awful lot. We swim and row, ride horseback, play tennis and basketball, and go on hikes. But after all, that was just play, sort of skipping round. This, this is the real thing. Giving her cousin an energetic good-night hug, she closed her eyes and was soon fast asleep. Marion did not fall asleep at once. Her mind was working over the mystery of the purple flame. What was it? What had caused it? Who were the persons back there in the old dredge? And why had they come here? Such were some of the problems that crowded her mind. The old dredge had been there for years. It was but one of the many monuments to men's folly in their greedy search for gold. These monuments, dredges, derricks, sluice boxes, crushers, smelters, and who knows what others, lined the beaches and rivers about Nome. The bed of the Sinrock River was known to run fairly rich in gold. Someone had imagined that he might become rich by dredging the mud at the bottom of the river and washing it for gold. The scheme had failed. Doubtless the owner of the dredge had gone into bankruptcy. At any rate, here was the old dredge with its long beams and gaping iron bucket still dangling in air, rotting to decay. And here within this tomb-like wreck had appeared the purple flame. It had not been like anything Marion had seen before. Almost like lightning, she mused sleepily. Being a healthy girl with a clean mind, she did not long puzzle her brain about the uncanny mystery of the weird light, but busied her mind with more practical problems. If these makers of the purple flame were to remain long at the dredge, how were they to live? Too often in the past the answer to such a question had been by secretly preying upon the nearest herd. The Sinrock herd had been moved some distance away. Marion's own herd was now the nearest one to the old dredge. And when we move into winter quarters, it will be five miles nearer. Oh, well, she sighed. There is no use borrowing trouble. It's probably some miners going up the river to do assessment work. But then, her busy mind questioned, what about the purple flame? Why have they already stayed there three weeks? Why? At this juncture she fell asleep, to awake when the first streaks of dawn were casting fingers of light across the snowy tundra. She crept softly from her sleeping bag, jumped into her clothes, and was in the act of lighting the fire when a faint sound of heavy breathing caused her to turn her head. To her surprise, she saw Patsy, clothed only in those garments that had served as her sleeping gown, doing a strange, whirling, barefooted fling of calisthenics, with the sleeping bag as her mat. "'You appear to have quite recovered,' Marion laughed. "'Just seeing if I was all here,' Patsy laughed in turn, as she dropped down upon the bag and began drawing on her stockings. "'Phew!' she puffed. "'That's invigorating. Good as a cold plunge in the sea.' What do we have for breakfast? Sourdough flapjacks and maple syrup. Mm-mm. Make me ten, exclaimed Patsy, redoubling her efforts to get herself dressed. That night, Marion made a discovery that set her nerves a-tremble to the very roots of her hair, and in spite of the arctic chill, brought beads of perspiration out on the tip of her nose. As on the previous night, they had camped out upon the open tundra, this night, however, they had found a sheltered spot beside a clump of willows that lined a stream. The stream ran between low, rolling hills. Over those hills they had been passing when darkness fell. Now, as Marion crept into the sleeping bag, she saw the nearer hills rising like cathedral domes above her. She heard the ceaseless rustle of willow leaves that, caught by an early frost, still clung to their branches. This rustle, together with the faint breeze that fanned her cheeks, had all but lulled her to sleep. Suddenly, she sat upright. It couldn't be, she exclaimed. Then a moment later, she added, But yes, there it is again. Who would believe it? Lightning in the Arctic, and on such a night as this, twenty below zero and clear as a bell, not a cloud in sight. Rubbing her brow to clear her mind from the cobwebs of dreams that had been forming there, she stared again at the crest of the hill. Then, swiftly, silently, that she might not waken her cousin, she crept from the sleeping bag. Donning her fur parka and drawing on knickers and deerskin boots, 
She hurried away from the camp and up the hill, thinking as she did so. That's not lightning. I don't know what it is, but in the name of all that's good, I'm going to come nearer solving that mystery than ever I did before. Halfway up the hill, she found a snow-blown gully, and up this she crept, half hidden by the shadows. Nearing the crest, a half-mile from her camp, she dropped on hands and knees and crawled forward a hundred yards. Then, like some hunter who has stolen upon his game, she propped herself on her elbows and stared straight ahead. In spite of her expectations, she gasped at what she saw. A purple flame, now six inches in length, now a foot, now two feet, darted out of space, then receded, then flared up again. Three feet above the surface of the snow, it appeared to hang in mid-air, like some ghost fire. Marian's heart beat wildly, her nerves tingled, her knees trembled, and open-mouthed, without the power to move, she stared at this strange apparition. This spell lasted for a moment, then, with a half-audible exclamation of disgust, she dropped limply to the snow. Inside a tent, she said, tent was so like the snow and the sky that I couldn't see it at first. As her eyes became accustomed to this version of her discovery, she was able to make out the outlines of the tent, and even to recognize a dog sleeping beside it. Suddenly the shadow of a person began dancing on the wall of the tent. So rapid were the flashes of the purple flame, so flickering and distorted was this image, that it seemed more the shadow of a ghost than of a human being. A second shadow joined the first. The two of them appeared to do some wild dance. Then, of a sudden, all was dark. The purple flame had vanished. A moment later a yellow light flared up. Then a steady light gleamed. Lighted a candle, was Marion's comment. It's on this side of them, for now they cast no shadows. Are they all men, or are there some women? How many are there? Two, or more than two? They are following us, I'd swear to that. I wonder why. Again she thought of the story she had heard of ne'er-do-wells who dogged the tracks of reindeer herds, like camp followers, and lived upon the deer that had strayed too far from the main herd. Perhaps, Marian mused, they have heard that father's herd is to be run this winter by two inexperienced girls. Perhaps they think we will be easy. Perhaps, she set her lips tight, perhaps we will, and perhaps not. We shall see. Then she went stealing back to her camp and crept shivering into the sleeping bag. She slept very little that night. The camp of the mysterious strangers was too close, and perplexing problems that lay before her, too serious to permit of that. She was glad enough when she caught the first faint flush of dawn in the east and knew that a new day was dawning. This day, she told herself, we make our own camp. There is comfort in that. Let the future take care of itself. She cast one glance toward the hill, but seeing no movement there, she began to search the ground for dry moss for kindling a fire. Soon she had the little yellow flame glowing in her Yukon stove. The feeble flame soon grew to a bright red, and in a little while the coffee-pot was singing its song of merry defiance to the arctic chill. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson Chapter 3 Marion Faces a Problem Marion buried her hand in the thick warm coat of the spotted reindeer that stood by her side, and, shading her eyes, gazed away at the distant hills. A brown spot had appeared at the crest of the third hill to her right. There's another, and another, she said. Reindeer or caribou, I wonder. If it's caribou, perhaps Terogluna can get one of them with his rifle. It would help out our food supply. But if it's reindeer, her brow wrinkled at the thought, reindeer might mean trouble. At that instant, something happened that brought her hand to her side. Quickly unstrapping her field glasses, she put them to her eyes. A fourth object had appeared on the crest. Even with the naked eye, one might tell that this one was not like the other three. He was lighter in color 
and lacked the lace-like suggestion against the sky which meant broad spreading antlers reindeer she groaned all of them reindeer and the last one's a sled deer his antlers have been cut off so he'll travel better and that means she pursed her lips in deep thought as the furrows in her brow deepened oh well she exclaimed at last perhaps it doesn't mean anything after all perhaps they're just a bunch of strays who knows but a sled reindeer she argued with herself they don't often stray away for a moment she stood staring at the distant hill crest then seizing her drive line she spoke to her deer as he bounded away she leaped nimbly upon the sled and went skimming along after him we'll see about that she said they're not our dear that's sure whose are they that's what we're about to find out a circle across the long valley then a stiff climb up the gully will just about bring us to their position fifteen minutes later she found herself atop the first elevation for the time out of sight of the strange reindeer she had an opportunity to glance back down the valley where her own herd was peacefully feeding her eyes lighted up as she looked it was indeed a beautiful sight winter had come for she and patsy martin had now been following the herd for three months winter having buried deep beneath the snow every trace of the browns and greens of summer had left only deep purple shadows and pale yellow lights over mountain hill and tundra in the midst of these lights and shadows such as are not seen save upon a sun-scorched desert or the winter charmed arctic her little herd of some four hundred deer stood out as if painted on a canvas or done in a bas-relief with wood or stone it's not like anything in the world said marian and i love it oh how i do love it how i wish i could paint it as it really is as she rode on up the valley her mind went over the months that had passed and the problems she and patsy now faced great was her love for the arctic fond as she was of its wild free life her father had made other plans for her plans that could not be carried out so long as they were in possession of the herd this seemed to make the sale of the herd an urgent necessity every letter from her father that came to her over hundreds of miles of dog sled and reindeer trail suggested some possible means of disposing of the herd we must sell by spring the last letter had said not that i am in immediate need of money but you must get back to school one year out there in the wilderness with patsy for your companion will do no harm but it must not go on the doctor says i cannot return to the north for four or five years at the least so somehow we must sell 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 marian repeated almost savagely it seemed to her that there could be no selling the herd there was only a limited market for reindeer meat miners here and there bought it the mining cities bought it but of late the increase to one hundred thousand reindeer in alaska had overloaded the market a little meat could be shipped to the states there to be served at great club luncheons and in palatial hotels but the demand was not large sell she questioned how can we sell little she knew how soon a possible answer to that question would come not knowing she visioned herself following the herd year after year while all those beautiful wonderful months she had had a taste of and now dreamed of by day and night faded from her thoughts she had spent one year under the shadows of a great university marvelous new thoughts had come to her that year friendships had been made such friendships as she in her northern wilds had never dreamed of the stately towers of the university even now appeared to loom before her and again she seemed to hear the melodious chimes of the bells oh she cried i must go back i must i must and yet marian was not unhappy for the present she would not be any other place than where she was it was a charming life this wandering life of the reindeer herder during the short summer and even into the frosts of fall and winter they lived in tents and like nomads of the desert wandered from place to place always seeking the freshest water the greenest grass the tallest willow bushes but when winter truly came swooping down upon them they went to a spot chosen months before the center of rich feeding grounds 
where the ground beneath the snow was green-white with reindeer moss. Here they made a more permanent camp. After that there remained but the task of defending the herd from wolves and other marauders, and of driving the herd to camp each day, that they might not wander too far away. As for Patsy, she had fairly reveled in it all. Reared in a city apartment where a chirping sparrow gave the only touch of nature, she had come to this wilderness with a great thirst for knowledge of the out-of-doors. Each day brought some new revelation to her. The snow-buntings, ptarmigans and ravens, the foxes, caribou and reindeer, even the occasional prowling wolves, all were her teachers. From them she learned many secrets of wild nature. Of course there had been long shut-in days when the wind swept the tundra and the snow, appearing to rest nowhere, whirled on and on. Such days were lonely ones. Letters were weeks in coming and arrived but seldom. All these things gave the energetic city lass some blue days, but even then she never complained. Her health was greatly improved. Gone was the nervous twitch of eyelids that told of too many hours spent poring over books. The summer freckles had been replaced by ruddy brown, such as only arctic winds and an occasional freeze can impart. As for her muscles, they were like iron bands. Never in the longest day's tramp did she complain of weariness. With the quick adaptability of a bright and cheerful girl, she had become a part of the wild world which surrounded her. The expression of her lips, too, was somehow changed. Firmness and determination were still written there, but certain lines had been added, lines of patience that said louder than words, I have learned one great lesson, that one may run uphill, but that mountains must be climbed slowly, patiently, circle by circle, till the summit is reached. They were in winter camp now. As Marian thought of it, she smiled. At no other spot in all Alaska was there another such camp as hers. Marian, as you know if you have read our other book, The Blue Envelope, had some two years before spent the short summer months in the Arctic of Siberia across from Alaska. Much against her own wishes, she had spent a part of the winter there. Someone had said, There is no great loss without some small gain, and while Marian had endured hardships and known moments of peril in Siberia, from the strange and interesting tribes there, she had learned some lessons of real value regarding winter camps in the Arctic. Upon making her own camp, she had put this knowledge into practice. They were now in winter camp. As Marian thought of this, then thought of the four strange reindeer on the ridge above, her brow again showed wrinkles of anxiety. If it's Bill Scarberry's herd, she said fiercely, clenching her fist, if it is... In her words, there was a world of feeling. In the early stages of the reindeer industry in Alaska, the problem of feed grounds for the deer had been exceedingly simple. There were the broad stretches of tundra, a hundred square miles for every reindeer. Help yourself. Every mile of it was matted deep with rich moss, every stream lined in summer with tender willow leaves. If you chanced to sight another small herd in your wandering, you went to right or left and so avoided them. There was room for all. Now things were vastly changed. One hundred thousand deer ranged the tundra. Reindeer moss, eaten away in a single season, requires four or five years to grow again in abundance. Back, back, farther and farther back from shore and river, the herds had been pushed, until now it was difficult indeed to transport food to the herders. With these conditions arising, the rivalry between owners for good feeding ground grew intense. Many and bitter were the feuds that had arisen between owners. There was not the best of feeling between Bill Scarberry, another owner, and her father. Marian knew that all too well. And now maybe his herd is coming into our feeding ground, she sighed. It was true that the government agent attempted to allot feeding grounds. The valley her deer were feeding upon had been written down in his book as her winter range, but when one is many days' travel from even the fringe of civilization, when one is the herder of but four hundred deer, and only a girl at that, when an overriding owner of ten thousand deer comes driving in his vast herd to lick up one's little pasture in a week or two, what is there to do? 
These were the bitter thoughts that ran through the girl's mind as she rode up the valley. The pasture to the right and left of them, and to the north, had been allotted for so many miles that it was out of the question to think of breaking winter camp and freighting supplies to some new range. No, she said firmly, we are here, and here we stay. Had she known the strange circumstances that would cause her to alter this decision, she might have been startled at the grim humour of it. End of chapter 3chapter four of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter four the range robber just as marian finished thinking these things through her reindeer gave a final leap which brought him squarely upon the crest of the highest ridge from this point so it seemed to her she could view the whole world as her eyes automatically sought the spot where the four reindeer had first appeared a stifled cry escaped her lips the valley at the foot of that slope was a moving sea of brown and white a great herd she exclaimed scarberry's herd the presence of this great herd at that spot meant almost certain disaster to her own little herd even if the herds were kept apart which seemed extremely unlikely her pasture would be ruined, and she had no other place to go. If the herds did mix, it would take weeks of patient toil to separate them. Toil on the part of all. Knowing Scarberry as she did, she felt certain that little of the work would be done by either his herders or himself. All up and down the coast, and far back into the interior, Scarberry was known for his selfishness, the brutality, and injustice of his actions such men should not be allowed on the alaskan range she hissed through tightly set teeth but here he is alaska is young it's a new and thrilling little world all of itself he who comes here must take his chance some day the dishonest men will be controlled or driven out for the present it's a fight and we must fight girls though we are we must fight and we will we will she stamped the snow savagely bill scarberry shall not have our pasture without a struggle had she been a heroine in a modern novel of the north she would have leaped upon her saddle deer put the spurs to his side and gone racing to the camp of the savage bill scarberry then and there to tell him exactly what her rights were and to dare him to trespass against them since so far as we know there are no saddle deer in alaska and no deer saddles to be purchased anywhere and since marian was an ordinary american girl with a good degree of common sense and caution and not a heroine at all in the vulgar sense of the word she stood exactly where she was and proceeded to examine the herd through her field glass if she had hoped against hope that this was not scarberry's herd at all but some other herd that was passing to winter quarters this hope was soon dispelled the four deer upon the ridge having strayed some distance from the main herd were now only a few hundred yards away she at once made out their markings two notches one circular and one triangular had been cut from the grisly portion of the right ear of each deer this brutal manner of marking so common a few years earlier had been kept up by scarberry who had as little thought for the suffering of his deer as he had for the rights of others the deer owned by the government and marian's own deer were marked by aluminum tags attached to their ears they're scarberry's all right marian concluded it's his herd and he brought them here if he had strayed away by accident and his herders had come after them they would be driving them back now they're just wandering along the edge of the herd keeping them together there comes one of them after the four strays no good seeing him now it wouldn't accomplish anything and i might say too much i'll wait and think turning her deer for a time she drove along the crest of the ridge i shouldn't wonder she said to herself if he's already taken up quarters in the old miner's cabin down there in the willows on the bank of the little sequina river yes she added there's the smoke of his fire 
to think she stormed enraged at the cool complacency of the thing to think that any man could be so mean he has thousands of deers and a broad rich range he's afraid the range may be scant in the spring and his deers become poor for the spring shipping market so he saves it by driving his herd over here for a month or two that it may eat all the moss we have and leave us to make a perilous or even fatal drive to distant pastures that or to see our deer starve before our very eyes it's unfair it's brutally inhuman and yet she sighed a moment later i suppose the men up here are not all to blame seems like there is something about the cold and darkness the terrible lonesomeness of it all that makes men like wolves that prowl in the scrub forests fierce bloodthirsty and savage but that will do for sentiment scarberry must not have his way he must not feed down our pasture if there is a way to prevent it and i think there is i'm almost sure i must talk to patsy about it it would mean something rather hard for her but she's a brave little soul god bless her then she spoke to her reindeer and went racing away down the slope toward the camp it was a strange-looking camp that awaited Marion's coming. Two dome-shaped affairs of canvas were all but hidden in a clump of willows, surrounded by deer sleds and a small canvas tent for supplies, surely a strange camp for Alaskan reindeer herders. But how comfortable were those dome-shaped igloos? Marion had learned to make them during that eventful journey with the reindeer chachis in Siberia. Winter skins of reindeer are cheap, very cheap, in Alaska. Being light, portable, and warm, Marian had used many of them in the construction of this winter camp. Her heart warmed with the prospect of perfect comfort, and drawing the harness from her reindeer, she turned it loose to graze. Then she parted the flap to the igloo, which she and Patsy shared. Something of the suppressed excitement which came to her from the discovery of the rival herd must still have shown in her face, for as Patsy turned from her work of preparing a meal, to look at Marion, she noticed the look on her face and exclaimed, "Oh, did you see it too?" "I'm not sure that I know what you mean," said Marion, puzzled by her question. "Where had Patsy been? Surely the herd could not be seen from the camp." And she had not said she was going far from it. In fact, she had been left to watch the camp. "I've seen enough," continued Marion, "to make me dreadfully angry. Something's got to be done about it right away too." As soon as we have a bite to eat, we'll talk it over. I knew you'd feel that way about it, said Patsy. I think it is a shame that they should hang about this way. See here, Patsy, exclaimed Marian, seizing her by the shoulder and turning her about. What are we, what are you talking about? Why, I, you, Patsy stammered, mystified. You just come out here and I'll show you. Dragging her cousin out of the igloo, and around the end of the willow she pointed toward the hill crest there atop the hill stood a newly erected tent and at that very moment its interior was lighted by a strange purple light the purple flame exclaimed marian more trouble or is it all one is it bill scarberry who lights that mysterious flame does he think that by doing that he can frighten us from our range bill scarberry questioned patsy who is he and what has he to do with it come on into the igloo and i'll tell you said marian shivering as a gust of wind swept down from the hill as they turned to go back patsy said terogluna came in a few minutes ago he said to tell you that another deer was gone this time it is a spotted two-year-old that makes seven that have disappeared in the last six weeks if that keeps up we won't need to sell our herd it will vanish like snow in the spring it can't be wolves they leave the bones behind you can always tell when they're about i wonder if those strange people of the purple flame are living off our deer i've a good mind to go right up there and accuse them of it but no i can't now there are other more important things before us what could be more important asked patsy in astonishment wait i'll tell you said marian as she parted the flap of the igloo and disappeared within a half hour later they were munching biscuits and drinking steaming coffee marian had said not a single word about the problems and adventures that lay just before them 
Patsy asked no questions. She knew that the great moment of confiding came when they were snugly tucked in beneath blankets and deerskins in the strangest little sleeping room in all the world. Knowing this, she was content to wait until night for Marion to tell her all about this important matter. End of chapter 4chapter five of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter five planning a perilous journey the house in which the girls lived was a cunningly built affair eight long poles brought from the distant river had been lashed together at one end then they had all been raised to an upright position and spread apart like the pole of an Indian's teepee. Canvas was spread over this circle of poles. That there might be more room in the tent, curved willow branches were lashed to the poles. These held the canvas away in a circle. After this had been accomplished, the hole inside was lined with deerskins. Only an opening at the top was left for the passing of smoke from the Yukon stove. The stove stood in the front centre of the house. Back of it was a platform six by eight feet. This platform was surrounded on all four sides and above by a second lining of deerskin. This platform formed the floor and the deerskins the walls of a little room within the skin house. This was the sleeping room of Marion and Patsy. A more cosy place could scarcely be imagined. Even with the thermometer at forty below and the wind howling about the igloo, this room was warm as toast with the sleeping bag for a bed and with a heavy deerskin rug and blankets piled upon them the girls could sleep in perfect comfort in this cozy spot with one arm thrown loosely about her cousin's neck marian lay that night for a full five minutes in perfect silent repose patsy she said as her arm suddenly tightened about her cousin's neck in an affectionate hug would you be terribly afraid to stay here all by yourself with the Eskimos? How, how long? Patsy faltered. I don't know exactly. Perhaps a week. Perhaps three. In the Arctic one never knows. Things happen. There are blizzards. Rivers cannot be crossed. There is no food to be had. Who knows what may happen? Why, no, said Patsy slowly. With Atatak here... I think I shouldn't mind. I think, said Marian, with evident reluctance, that I should take Atatak with me. I'd like to take old Terogluna. He'd be more help, but at a time like this he can't leave the herd. He's absolutely faithful, will give his life for us. Father once saved him from drowning when a skin boat was run down by a motor launch. An Eskimo never forgets. How strangely you talk, said Patsy suddenly. Is, is the purple flame as serious an affair as that? Oh, no, answered Marian. That may become serious. They may be killing our deer, but we haven't caught them at it. That, for the present, is just an interesting mystery. But what are you... Where are you going? Listen, Patsy, said Marian thoughtfully. Do you remember the radio message we picked up three days ago? The one from the government agent sent from Nome to Fairbanks. Patsy did remember. She had spent many interesting hours listening in on the compact but powerful radio set her father had presented to her as a parting gift. Yes, she said, I remember. When did he say he was leaving Nome? The 5th. That means he'll be at the Simons trading station on about the 12th, and Simons is the spot on the Nome Fairbanks trail that is nearest to us. By fast driving and good luck, I can get there before him. But why should you? persisted Patsy. Then Marian confided to her cousin the new trouble they were facing, the almost certain loss of their range with all the calamities that would follow. If only I can see the agent before he passes on to Fairbanks, I am sure he would deputize someone to come over here and compel Scarberry to take his herd from our range. If I can't do that then I don't see that we have a single chance. We might as well, as well, there was a catch in her voice, 
as well make Scarberry a present of our herd and go on our way back to Nome. We'd be flat broke, not a penny in the world, and father, father would not have a single chance for a fresh start. But we will be ruined soon enough if we try to put up a fight all by ourselves, for Scarber is too strong. He's got three herders to our one. The agent is our only chance. For a long time after this speech, all was silence, and Marion was beginning to think that Patsy had gone to sleep. Then she felt her soft, warm hand steal into hers as she whispered, No, I'm not afraid. I'll, I'll stay, and I'll do all I can to keep that thief and his deer off our range until you get back. I'll do it, too. See if I don't. Patsy's southern fighting blood was up. At such a time, she felt equal to anything. All right, old dear, only be careful. Marion gave her a rousing hug then whispered as she drew the deerskins about her go to sleep now i must be away before dawn end of chapter 5chapter 6 of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 6 a journey well begun two hours before the tardy dawn marian and attatak were away with three tried and trusted reindeer spot whitey and brownie they were to attempt a journey of some hundreds of miles across trackless wilderness they must lay their course by the stars until the little calicumph river was reached after this it was a straight course down a well-marked trail to the trading station providing the river was fully frozen over the river was one of the many problems they must face there were others stray dogs might attack their deer they might cross the track of a mother wolf and her hungry pack of half-grown cubs a blizzard might overtake them and lacking the guiding light of the stars they might become lost and wander aimlessly on the tundra until cold and hunger claimed them for their own but of all these marian thought most of the river would it be frozen over or would they be forced to turn back after covering all those weary miles and enduring the hardships attatak she said to the native girl they say the little calicumph river has rapids in it by the end of a glacier and that no man dares shoot those rapids is that true eh, eh. Yes, answered Atatak. Spirit of water angry at ice cut away far below. Want to shoot rapids, boat and man run beneath that ice. Soon smashed boat, killed man, that's all. It was quite enough, Marion thought, but somehow they must pass these rapids, whether they were frozen over or not. Ah, well, she sighed, that's still far away. First comes the fight with tundra, hills and sweeping winds. Patting her reindeer on the side, she sent him flying up the valley while she raced along beside him. These reindeer were wonderful steeds. No food need be carried for them. They found their own food beneath the snow when day was done. A hundred miles in a day, over a smooth trail, was not too much for them. Soft snow, the wind-blown blizzard-sifted snow that was like granulated sugar, did not trouble them. They trotted straight on. There was no need to search out a waterhole that they might slake their thirst. They scooped up mouthfuls of snow as they raced along. Wonderful old friends, murmured Marion as she reached out a hand to touch her spotted leader. There are those who say a dog team is better. Bill Scarberry, they say, never drives reindeer, always drives dogs. But on a long journey, a great marathon race reindeer would win i do believe they would i she was suddenly startled from her reflections by the appearance of a brown hooded head not twenty rods away their course had led them closer to scarberry's camp than she thought as she came out upon the ridge she saw an eskimo scout disappearing into the willows from which a camp smoke was rising marian was greatly disturbed by the thought that scarberry's camp would soon know of her departure she had hoped that they might not learn of her errand that they might not miss her from the camp for patsy's sake she was tempted to turn back 
but after a moment's indecision she determined to push forward there was no other way to win and win she must an hour later she halted the deer at a fork in the trail directly before her stood a bold range of mountains and their peaks seemed to be smoking with drifting snow blizzards were there the perpetual blizzards of arctic peaks she had never crossed those mountains perhaps no person ever had she had intended skirting them to the north this would require at least one added day of travel as she thought of the perils that awaited patsy while alone with the herd and as she thought of the great necessity of making every hour count she was tempted to try the mountain pass here was a time for decision when all might be gained by a bold stroke rising suddenly on tiptoe as if thus to emphasize a great resolve she pointed away to the mountains and said with all the dignity of a jeanne d'arc at attack we go that way wide-eyed with amazement at attack stared at marion for a full minute then with a cheerful smile of a born explorer which any member of her race always is she said nagu varuktak that will be very good end of chapter 6chapter 7 of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 7 the enchanted mountain since the time she had been able to remember anything these mountains of the far north standing away in bleak triangles of lights and shadows smoking with the eternally drifting snows had always held an all but irresistible lure for marion even as a child of six listening to the weird folk stories of the eskimo she had peopled those treeless wind-swept mountains with all manner of strange folks now they were fairies white and drifting as the snow itself now they were strange black goblins with round faces and red noses and now an eskimo people who lived in enchanted caves that were never cold no matter how bitterly the wind and cold assailed the fortresses of rocks that offered them protection all my life she murmured as she tightened the rawhide thong that served as a belt to bind her parka close about her waist i have wanted to go to the crest of that range and now i am to attempt it she shivered a little at thought of the perils that awaited her many were the strange wild tales she had heard told round the glowing stove at the back of her father's store tales of privation freezing starvation and death tales told by grizzled old prospectors who had lost their pals in a bold struggle with the elements she thought of these stories and again she shivered but she did not turn back once only after an hour of travel up steep ravines and steeper foothills she paused to unstrap her field glasses and look back over the way they had come then she threw back her head and laughed it was the wild free laugh of a daring soul that defies failure attatak showed all her splendid white teeth in a grin who is afraid marian laughed snow cold wind who cares marian spoke to her reindeer and again they were away as they left the foothills and began to circle one of the lesser peaks a slow gradually rising spiral circle that brought them higher and higher marian felt the old charm of the mountains come back to her again they were peopled by strange fairies and goblins so real was the illusion that at times it seemed to her that if worst came to worst and they found themselves lost in a storm at the mountain top they might call upon these phantom people for shelter the mountain was not exactly as she had expected to find it she had supposed that it was one vast cone of gleaming snow in the main this was true yet here and there some rocky promontory towering higher than its fellows reared above the surface a pier of granite standing out black against the whiteness about it mute monument to all those daring climbers who have lost their lives on mountain peaks once too off in the distance to her right and farther up she fancied she saw the yawning mouth of a cavern doesn't seem possible she told herself and yet it did seem so real 
that she found herself expecting some strange Rip Van Winkle-like people to come swarming out of the cavern. She shook herself as a rude blast of wind swept up from below, all but freezing her cheek at a single wild whirl. I must be dreaming, she told herself stoutly. Night is falling. We are on the mountain, near in the crest. A storm is rising. It is colder here than in any place I've ever been. Perhaps we have been foolhardy, but now we must go on. Even as she thought this through, Atatak pointed to her cheek and exclaimed, Froze tuck! My cheek frozen, Marion cried in consternation. Eh, eh! Yes. And we have an hour's climb to reach the top, perhaps more. Somehow we must have shelter. Atatak, can you build a snow house? Not very good. Not build them any more, my people. Then, then, said Marion slowly, as she rubbed snow on the white frozen spots on her cheek, then we must go on. Five times in the next twenty minutes, Atatak told her her cheeks were frozen. Twice, Atatak had been obliged to rub the frost from her own cheeks. Each time, the intervals between freezings were shorter. Atatak, Marion asked, can we make it? Cannot Timana. I don't know. The Eskimo girl's face was very grave. As Marion turned about, she realized that the storm from below was increasing. Snow, stopping nowhere, raced past them to go smoking out over the mountain peak. She was about to start forward when again she caught sight of a dark spot on the mountain side above. It looked like the mouth of a cavern. If only it were, she said wistfully, we could camp there for the night and wait for the worst of the storm to pass. Atatak, she said suddenly, you wait here. I am going to try to climb up there. She pointed to the dark spot on the hillside. All right, said Atatak. Be careful. Foot slip, start to slide, never stop. She looked first up the hill, then down the dizzy white slope that extended for a half mile to unknown depths below. As Marion's gaze followed Atatak's, she saw herself gliding down the slope, gaining speed, shooting down faster and faster to some awful, unknown end. A dash against a projecting rock, a burial beneath a hundred feet of snow. Little wonder that her knees trembled as she turned to go, yet she did not falter. With a cheerful, all right, I'll be careful, she gripped her staff and began to climb. End of chapter 7「Eight of the Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Eight Trouble for Patsy. Hardly had Marian left camp when troubles began to pile up for Patsy. Dawn had not yet come when she heard a strange ki ying that certainly did not come from the herd collies and she looked out and saw approaching the most disreputable group of Eskimos she had ever seen. Dressed in ragged parkas of rabbit skins and driving the gauntest, most vicious-looking pack of wolf-dogs, these people appeared to come from a new and more savage world than hers. A rapid count told her that there were seven adults and five children. Enough of them to eat us out of everything even to skin boots and rawhide harness, she groaned. If they are determined to camp here, who's to prevent them? For a moment she stood there staring. Then, with a sudden resolve that she must meet the situation, she exclaimed, I must send them on. Some way I must. I can't let them starve. They must have food, but they must be sent on to some spot where they have relatives who are able to feed them. The safety of the herd depends upon that. With food gone, we cannot hold our herders. With no herders, we cannot hold the deer. Marion explained that to me yesterday. Walking with all the dignity her sixteen years would permit, she approached the spot where the strangers had halted their dogs and were talking to old Terragluna. The dogs were acting strangely. 
Sawing at the strong rawhide bonds that held them to the sleds, they reared up on their haunches, keying for all they were worth. They smell our deer, Patsy said to herself. It's a good thing our herd is at the upper end of the range. She remembered hearing Marion tell how a whole herd of five thousand deer had been hopelessly stampeded by the lusty keying of one wolf dog. The reindeer is their natural food. Marion had explained if even one of them gets loose when there is a reindeer about he will rush straight at him and leap for his throat That's one more reason why I must get these people to move on at once Patsy whispered to herself To Terragluna she said what do they want? Terragluna turned to them with a simple Suna go pezuk Pete he asked what do you want? With many guttural expressions and much waving of hands, the leader explained their wishes. He say, smiled Terogluna, that in the hills about here are many foxes, black fox, red fox, white, blue and cross fox. He say, that one, want to camp here, want to set traps, want to catch foxes. But what will they eat? asked Patsy. Terogluna, having interpreted the question, smiled again at their answer. They will eat foxes, he answered quietly and modestly. For a moment, Patsy looked into their staring, hungry, questioning eyes. They were lying, and she knew it, but remembering a bit of advice of her father's, never quarrel with a hungry person, feed him. She smiled as she said to Terogluna, you tell them that this morning they shall eat breakfast with me that we will have pancakes and reindeer steak and tea with plenty of sugar in it Capseta Alinasa Capseta exclaimed one of the strangers who had understood the word sugar and was passing it on in the native word Capseta to his companions It was a busy morning for Patsy there seemed no end to the appetites of these half-starved natives even Terogluna grumbled at the amount they ate, but Patsy silenced him with the words, First they must be fed, then we will talk to them. Troubles seldom come singly. Hardly had the last pancake been devoured than Terogluna, looking up from his labors, uttered an exclamation of surprise. A half mile up from the camp, the tundra was brown with feeding reindeer. Scarberry's herd he hissed oh Exclaimed Patsy they dare to do that they dare to drive their deer on our nearest and best pasture And what can we do to stop them? Must Marion's mission be in vain must she go all the way for nothing if they remain the range will be stripped long before she can return Pressing her hands to her temples she sat down unsteadily upon one of the sleds of the strangers She was struggling in a wild endeavor to think of some way out Then of a sudden a wolf dog jumped up at her very feet and began to key ye in a most distressing fashion Looking up she saw that three of Scarberry's deer having strayed nearer the camp than the others had attracted the dog's attention Like a flash a possible solution to her problem popped into Patsy's head With a cry of delight she sprang to her feet the next instant. She was her usual calm self Terogluna she said steadily come into the tent for a moment I have something I wish to ask you the task which Marion had set for herself the scaling of the mountain to the dark spot in its side was no easy one Packed by the beating blast of a thousand gales the snow was like white flint It rang like steel to the touch of her iron shod staff It was impossible to make an impression in its surface with the soft heel of her deerskin boots The only way she could make progress was by the aid of her staff One slip of that staff one false step and she would go gliding faster faster even faster to a terrible death far below Yet to falter now meant that death of another sort waited her death in the form of increasing cold and gathering storm Yet she made progress in spite of the cold that numbed her hands and feet in spite of her wildly beating heart 
regardless of the terror that gripped her. Now she had covered half the distance, now two-thirds, now she could be scarcely a hundred yards away. And now she saw clearly. She had not been mistaken. That black spot in the wall of snow was a yawning hole in the side of the mountain, a refuge in the time of storm. Could she but reach it, all would be well. Could she do it? From her position the way up appeared steeper. She thought of going back for the reindeer. Their knife-like hoofs cutting into the flinty snow would carry them safely upward. She now regretted that she had not driven one before her. Vain regret. To descend now was more perilous than to go forward. So gripping her staff firmly, pressing her breast to still the wild beating of her heart, and setting her eyes upon the goal, lest they stray to the depths below, she again began to climb. Now she began going first to right, then to left. This zigzag course, though longer, was less steep. Up, up, up she struggled, until at last, with an exultant cry of joy, she threw herself over a broad parapet of snow, and the next instant found herself looking down at a world which but for the moment before had appeared to be reaching up white menacing hands at her. Then she turned to peer into the dark depths of the cave. She shivered as she looked. Her old fancies of fairies and goblins of strange wild people inhabiting these mountains came sweeping back and quite unnerved her. The next moment she was herself again, and turning she called down to Atatak, Woohoo! Woohoo! Bring the reindeer up! Here is shelter for the night! An inaudible answer came floating back to her. Then she saw the reindeer turn about and begin the long, zigzag course that in time would bring them to the mouth of the newly discovered cave. And then, Marion said softly to herself, she was no longer afraid of the dark shadows behind her. In the place of fear had come a great curiosity. The same questions which have come to all people throughout all time upon discovering a strange cave in the mountains had come to her. Am I, she asked herself, the first person whose footsteps have echoed in those mysterious corridors of nature? Or have they been others? If there have been others, who were they? What were they like? What did they leave behind that will tell the story of their visit here? Marian tried to shake herself free from these questions. It was extremely unlikely that anyone in all the hurrying centuries had ever passed this way. They were on the side of a mountain. She had never known of a person crossing the range before. So she reasoned, but in the end found herself hoping that this cave might yield to her adventure-loving soul some new and hitherto inexperienced thrill. In the meantime, she heard the laboured breathing of the reindeer as they toiled up the mountainside. They would soon be here. Then she and Atatak would make camp, and safe from the cold and storm they would sleep in peace. A great wave of thankfulness swept over her, and with the fervent reverence of a child she lifted her eyes to the stars and uttered a prayer of thanksgiving. When the wave of emotion had passed, curiosity again gripped her. She wished to enter the cave, yet shrank from it, like a child afraid of the dark. She feared to go forward alone, so, drawing her parka hood close about her face to protect it from the cold, she waited for Atatak's arrival. Even as she waited, there crept into her mind a disturbing question. I wonder, she said aloud, I do wonder how Patsy is getting along with the herd. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of the Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Nine Patsy Solves a Problem. Turning from the group of strange natives, Patsy led Terragluna into the igloo, and drawing his grandfatherly head down close to hers, she whispered, Terragluna, a reindeer much afraid of native wolf dogs? Eh, eh. Terragluna nodded his head. Very, very, very much afraid of them? Patsy insisted. Terragluna's head nodded vigorously. Then, said Patsy with a twinkle in her eye, if we let one wolf dog loose, and he went toward Bill Scarberry's herd, 
Would they run away? Eh eh. Maybe. Want to kill reindeer, that dog. Maybe kill one, two, three, many. Sometimes that way, wolf dogs. Terragluna's horror of the thing she had proposed shone in his eyes. Many years he had been a herder of reindeer. Many a dog had he killed to save a reindeer. His love for dogs was strong. His love for reindeer was stronger. To deliberately turn a wolf dog loose to prey upon a herd of reindeer, even an enemy's herd, was unthinkable. Patsy, having read his thoughts, threw back her head and laughed. We won't do that, she said soberly. But Terragluna, if each one of those strange Eskimo people should take a dog by his draw rope, and then they all should walk toward that old cheat's herd, what would happen? A sudden gleam stole into the aged herder's eyes. He was beginning to catch her meaning. The deer were upon forbidden ground. She was finding a way to drive them back to the place where they belonged. They would go away very fast, he said quickly. And would these Eskimos do that? Would they do it for two sacks of flour, two cans of baking powder, two slabs of bacon and some sugar? Asked Patsy breathlessly. For all that, said Terragluna, staring at her, they would do anything, anything you say. Go tell them, and they shall have it, said Patsy. Tell them they must drive Scarberry's herd back to the Cumsaw River Valley, where they belong, and that they may take their flour, sugar, and other things along. The Eskimos crowded about Terragluna, listened to him in silence until he had finished, then burst into a chorus of Eh, eh, ke, ke, kelimak, ke, ke, which Patsy rightfully interpreted as meaning that they were ready for the enterprise, and that Terragluna was to bring on the reward. It was a strange line of march that formed soon after, seven Eskimos each holding to a strap, at the other end of which a native dog reared and kiyied, spread out in a broad line, and followed by a sled drawn by the four remaining dogs, they started towards Scarberry's herd. As they came closer to the herd, the leaders of the antlered throng tossed their heads and whistled. As they came still closer, there sounded the rattle of antler upon antler, as the herd backed in upon itself. The solitary herder, who had been left to watch the herd, looked at the oncoming members of his own race, and then shouted at them angrily. The Eskimos with the dogs marched straight ahead, appearing not to hear the shouts of the angry herder. In less time than it takes to tell it, the herd was in full stampede. In vain were the shouts of Scarberry's herders. In vain their herd dogs sought to stem the flight. The reindeer had scented their ancient foe. They had heard his loud ki-yi. They were headed for their home range and would not pause until they had reached it. Marion's hills and tundra were not for them. As for Scarberry's herders, they might remain where they were or follow. They chose to follow. An hour later, with a sigh of satisfaction, Patsy saw them driving their sled deer over the broad trail of the herd that had vanished. "'Will they come back?' she asked Terragluna. "'Maybe yes, maybe no,' said Terragluna. "'Can't tell.' For a moment he was silent. Then, with a queer look on his face, he said, "'One thing I am much afraid of.' "'What is that?' asked Patsy. "'Maybe not come.' said Terragluna, looking as if he was sorry he had spoken. That was all he would say, and Patsy felt a bit uneasy over his remark. Nevertheless, she could not help having a feeling of pride in her first day's work as manager of the herd. Two serious problems had arisen, and she had matched them against each other, with the result that both had vanished. She had succeeded in getting rid of the unwelcome visitors, and Bill Scarberry's great herd, she had a right to feel a bit proud. Ten minus ten equals zero, she marked on the floor with a bit of charcoal. We are minus a few eatables, but we can spare them all right. Besides, it's real satisfying to know that you've given several hungry people an opportunity to earn a week's provisions. Had she known the full and final effect of that week's provisions, she might have experienced some moments of uncomfortable thinking. Lacking that knowledge, she smiled as she busied herself with preparing a belated breakfast for Terragluna and herself. End of chapter 9
Chapter Ten of the Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Ten: A Startling Discovery. To Atatak, whose mind was filled with the weird tales of the spirit world, to enter a cave away on this unknown mountainside was a far greater trial than it was to Marion. Cold blizzards the wild beasts of timberlands these she could face but the possible dwelling place of the spirits of dead polar bears and walruses to say nothing of old women who had died because they had disregarded the incantations of witch doctors oh this was very bad indeed marian felt the native girl tremble as she took her arm and led her gently forward into the dark depths of the cave the entrance was not wide perhaps twelve feet across but it was fully as high as it was broad our dear can come in too whispered marian if it goes back far enough if there are no wolves said attatak with a shudder wolves marian had not thought of that you wait here she whispered i'll go for the rifle no no attatak gripped her arm until it hurt i will go too so back out of the cave they felt their way now tripping over rocks that rolled away with a hollow sound like distant thunder now brushing the wall till they came at last to the open air marian hated all this delay famished with hunger chilled to the very marrow and weary enough to drop she longed for the warmth of the fire she hoped they might light for the food she could warm over it and the comforting rest that would follow Yet she realized that the utmost caution must be taken Wolves once driven from a cave might stampede their reindeer and lose them forever in the mountains Without reindeer they should have great trouble in getting back to camp the agent would go on his way ignorant of their dilemma Their pasture land would be lost and perhaps their herd with it The rifle securely gripped in the hands of Atatak who was the surer shot of the two they again started into the cave Strange to say once the rifle was in her grasp at attack became the bravest of the brave Marion carried a candle in one hand and in the other a block of safety matches the candle was not lighted So drafty was the entrance that no candle would stay lighted Each step she hoped would bring them to a place where the draft would not extinguish her candle But in this she was disappointed it's a windy cavern she said must be an entrance at each end Calling on Atatak to pause Marion struck a match it flared up then went out a second one did the same The third lighted the candle there was just time for a hasty glance about Gloomy brown walls lay to right and left of them and the awful gloom of the cave was most alarming Glancing down at her feet Marian uttered a low exclamation of surprise Then with such a definite and direct puff of wind as might come from human lips The candle was snuffed out What what was it? Atatak whispered she was shaking so that Marian feared she would let the rifle go clattering to the rocky floor Nothing Marian answered really nothing at all the ashes of a campfire and I thought thought she gulped Thought I saw bones in the ashes Bones this time the rifle did clatter on the floor At attack Marion scolded at attack. This is absurd Groping in the dark for the rifle she grasped a handful of ashes then something hard and cold that was not the rifle Oh She groaned struggling with all her might to keep from running away Again she tried for the rifle this time successfully she gave it to Atatak with the admonition Kaka do take care eh, eh, Atatak whispered Stepping gingerly out of the ashes of the mysterious campfire they again started forward The current of air now became less and less strong and finally when Marion again tried the candle it burned with a flickering blaze a glance about told them they were now between narrow dark walls that the ceiling was very high and there was nothing beneath their feet but rock the yellow glow of light cheered them if there were wolves they made no sound 
the gleam of their eyes had not been seen if the spirits of the men who had built that long extinguished fire still haunted the place the light would drive them away attatak assured marian of that with one candle securely set in a rocky recess and with another close at hand attatak was even willing to remain in the cave while marian brought the reindeer in a little way and carried the articles necessary for a meal to the back of the cave there is no moss on this barren mountain marian sighed our reindeer must go hungry tonight but once we are off the mountain they shall have a grand feast by the time they had made a small fire on the floor of the cave and had finished their supper night had closed in upon their mountain world darkness came quickly deepened tenfold by the wild storm that appeared to redouble its fury at every fresh blast the darkness without vied with the bleakness of the cave until both were one such a storm as it was born and reared on the coast of alaska marian had never before experienced anything that approached it in its shrieking violence she did not wonder now that the mountains appeared to smoke with sweeping snow she shivered as she thought what it would have meant had they not found the cave why she said to attatak we should have been caught up by the wind like two bits of snow and hurled over the mountain peak the two girls walked to the mouth of the cave and for a moment stood peering into the night the whistle and howl of the wind was deafening hoo, 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 hoo. how it did howl the very rock-ribbed mountain seemed to shake from the violence of it elite ponamuk too bad said attatak as she turned her back to the storm for marian however the spectacle held a strange fascination had the thing been possible she would have liked nothing better than leaping out into it to battle with it to answer its roar with a wild scream of her own to whirl away with it to become a part of it to revel in its madness this it seemed to her would be the height of ecstatic joy such was the call of unbridled nature to her joyous triumphant youth it was with reluctance that she at last turned back into the depths of the cave and helped attatak unroll the bedding roll and prepare for the night tomorrow she whispered to attatak before she closed her eyes in sleep if the storm has not passed and we dare not venture out we will explore the cave eh, eh, attatak answered drowsily the next moment the roaring storm had no auditors the girls were fast asleep End of chapter 10chapter 11 of the purple flame this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson the purple flame by roy j snell chapter 11 the girl of the purple flame there is something in the sharp tang of the arctic air in the honest weariness of a long day of tramping in the invigorating freshness of everything about one that makes for perfect repose in spite of the problems that face them regardless of the mystery that haunted this chamber of nature hour after hour to the very tune of the whirling storm the girls slept the calm and peaceful sleep of those who bear ill will towards no one when at last marian pried her eyes open to look at her watch she was surprised to learn that eight hours had passed she did not look to see the gleam of dawn at the mouth of the cave dawn in this strange arctic land was still four hours away she knew that the storm was still raging there came the roar and boom of the wind now and again as if the demons of storm were determined upon pulling them from their retreat a steady sucking breath of it came sweeping down through the cave marian listened and then quoted blow high blow low not all your snow can quench the our earth fire's ruddy glow she smiled to herself their tiny fire had gone out long ago but another might easily be kindled she was about to turn over in her bed for another ten winks when she suddenly remembered the mysterious discovery of the night before 
the ashes and the bones and at once she found herself eager for an exploration of the place to discover if possible what sort of people had been here before her to guess how long ago that had been to search for any relics they may have left behind all these exerted upon her mind an irresistible appeal she had risen and was drawing on her knickers when Attatak awakened come on marion cried it is morning the storm is still tearing away at the mountainside we can't go on our way we elite ponamak too bad broke in Attatak. now bill scarberry will get our pasture the agent will pass before we arrive we shall have no one to defend our herd at this marion plumped down upon her sleeping bag what Attatak said was true should they be unable to leave the cave this day the gain they had hoped to make was lost well she laughed bravely we have reindeer and they are swift we will win yet anyway she said springing to her feet no use crying over spilled milk until we can leave the cave our time's our own come on get dressed we'll see what wealth lies hidden in this old home in the mountainside in the meantime patsy was having a full share of strange adventure late in the afternoon feeling herself quite free from the annoying presence of the visiting band of eskimos and of scarberry's herd she harnessed her favorite spotted reindeer and went for a drive up the valley the two young eskimos who worked under terogluna had been sent into the hills to round up their herd and bring them into camp this was one of the daily tasks of the herders if this was done every day the herd would never stray too far Patsy liked to mount a hill with her sled deer and then like a general reviewing his troops watch the broad procession of brown and white deer as they marched down the valley This day she was a little late the herd began passing before she had climbed halfway up the ridge She paused to watch them pass then undecided whether to climb up the slope or turn back to camp She stood there until the uncertain light of the low arctic Sun had faded and night had come just as she had decided to turn her deer toward home she caught a purple gleam on the hill directly above her the purple flame she exclaimed and not a quarter of a mile above me i could climb up there in fifteen minutes for a moment she stood undecided then seized by a sudden touch of daring she whirled her deer about tethered him to his sled and went scouting up a gully toward the spot where the mysterious flame had flashed for a moment then had gone out I'll see something anyway she told herself as she strove in vain to still the painful fluttering of her heart She had worked her way to a position on the side of the hill where the outlines of a tent with its extension of stovepipe standing out black above it was outlined against the sky then to her consternation she saw the flaps of the tent move Someone is coming out she whispered to herself Perhaps they have been watching me through a hole in the tent perhaps Her heart stopped beating at thought of the dangers that might be threatening Should she turn and flee or should she flatten herself against the snow and hope that she might not be seen? Suddenly remembering that her parka made of white fawn skin would blend perfectly with the snow she decided on the latter course there was not a second to lose hardly had she melted into the background of snow when a person appeared at the entrance of the tent then it was that patsy received a thrilling shock she had been prepared to see a bearded miner an eskimo most any type of man but the person she saw was not a man but a woman scarcely that little more than a girl it was with the utmost difficulty that patsy suppressed an audible exclamation closing her lips tight she took one startled look at the strange girl carefully dressed in short plaid skirt bright checkered mackinaw and a blue knit hood the girl stood perfectly silhouetted against the sky her eyes and hair were brown patsy was sure of that her features were fine there was a deep shade of healthy pink in her cheeks She's not a native Alaskan Patsy told herself like me. She has not been long in Alaska How she knew this she could not exactly tell but she was as sure of it as she was of anything in her life Suddenly she was puzzled by a question 
What had brought the girl from the warmth of the tent into the cold? Patsy saw her glance up toward the sky. There was a rapt look on her face as she gazed fixedly at the first evening stars. It's as if she were saying a prayer or a psalm, Patsy murmured. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament his handiwork. For a full moment, the strange girl stood thus. Then, turning slowly, she stepped back into the tent. That the tent had at least one other occupant, Patsy knew at once by a shadow that flitted across the wall as the girl entered. Well, mused Patsy, well now, I wonder. She was more puzzled than ever, but suddenly, remembering that she had barely escaped being caught spying on these strangers, she rose and went gliding down the hill. When she reached her reindeer, she loosed him and turned him toward home, nor did she allow him to pause until he stood beside her igloo. Once inside her lodge, with the candle gleaming brightly and a fire of dry willows snapping at the sheet-iron stove, Patsy took a good long time for thinking things through. Somewhat to her surprise, she found herself experiencing a new feeling of safety. It was true she had not been much afraid since Marion had left her alone with the herders, for it was but a step from her igloo to Terragluna's tent. This old herder, who treated her as if she were his grandchild, would gladly give his life in defending her from danger. Nevertheless, a little feeling of fear lingered in her mind whenever she thought of the tent of the purple flame. As she thought of it now, she realized that she had lost that fear when she had discovered that there was a girl living in that tent. And yet, she told herself, there are bad women in Alaska just as there are everywhere. She might be bad, but somehow she didn't look bad. She looked educated and sort of refined and... and... She looked a bit lonely as she stood there gazing at the stars. I wanted to walk right up to her and say hello, just like that, nice and chummy. Perhaps I will, too, some day. And perhaps I won't, she thoughtfully added a moment later. Something of the old dread of the purple flame still haunted her mind. Then, too, there were two puzzling questions. Why were these people here at all, and how did they live, if not off Marion's deer? Not many days later, Patsy was to make a startling discovery that, to all appearances, was an answer to this last question. End of chapter 11chapter 12 of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 12 ancient treasure with a hand that trembled slightly marian held the candle that was to light their way in the exploration of the mysterious mountain cavern as if drawn by a magnet she led the way straight to the spot where but a few hours before she had been so frightened by finding herself standing in the burned-out ashes and bones of an old campfire. She laughed now as she bent over to examine the spot. There could be no question that there had once been a campfire here. There were a number of bones strewn about, too. That fire, she said slowly, must have burned itself out years ago, perhaps fifty years. Those bones are from the legs of a reindeer or caribou. They're old, too. How grey and dry they are. They are about to fall into dust. She studied the spot for some time. At last, she straightened up. Not much to it, after all, she sighed. It's interesting enough to know that some storm-blown traveller who attempted the pass, as we did, once spent the night here. But he left no relic of interest behind, unless... Why? What have you got there? She turned suddenly to her companion. Atatak was holding a slim, dull brown object in her hand. Only the broken handle of an old cow drill, she said slowly, still studying the thing by the candlelight. It's ivory. Eh, uh eh. -uh. And quite old. Maybe twenty, maybe fifty years, who knows? Why are you looking at it so sharply? Trying to read. Read what? Well, smiled Atatak as she placed the bit of ivory in marian's hand long ago before the white man came my people told stories by drawing little pictures on ivory 
They scratched the pictures on the ivory, then rubbed smoke black in them, so they would see them well. This cow drill handle is square. It has four sides. Each side tells a story. Three are of hunting, walrus, polar bear, and caribou. But the other side is something else. I can't quite tell what it says. Marion studied it for a time in silence. Mr. Cole would love that, she said at last, and her thoughts were far away. For the moment her mind had carried her back to those thrilling days aboard the pleasure yacht, the Omu. Since you have doubtless read our other book, The Cruise of the Omu, I need scarcely remind you that Mr. Cole was the curator of a great museum and knew all about strange and ancient things. He had done much to aid Marian and her friends in unravelling the mystery of the strange blue face. Bring it along, Marian said, handing the piece back to Atatak. It tells us one thing, that the man who built that fire was an Eskimo. It is worth keeping. I should like to take it with me to the museum when I go back. Now, she said briskly, let's go all over the cave. There may be things that we have not yet discovered. And indeed there were. It was with the delicious sensation of research and adventure that the girls wandered back and forth from wall to wall of the gloomy cavern. Not until they had passed the spot where they had spent the night, and were far back in the cave, did they make a discovery of any importance. Then it was that Marion, with a little cry of joy, put out her hand and took from a ledge of rock a strange-looking little dish, no larger than a finger bowl, it was so encrusted with dirt and dust that she could not tell whether it was really a rare find of some ancient pottery or an ordinary china dish left here by some white adventurer. However, something within her seemed to whisper, Here is wealth untold. Here is a prize that will cause your friend, the museum curator, to turn green with envy. Suli! Another, said Atatak as she took down a larger object of the same general shape. A few feet farther on was a ledge fairly covered with curious objects, strange shaped dishes, bits of ivory black as coal, pieces of copper dulled with age. Such were the treasures of the past that lay before them. Someone's pantry of long ago, mused Marian. Very, very old, said Atatak, holding up a bit of black ivory. Maybe two hundred, maybe five hundred years. Ivory turned black slow very very slow by and by after long long time look like that as Atatak uttered these words marian could have hugged her for sheer joy she knew now that they had made a very rare find the objects had not been left there by a white man but by some native broken bits of ancient eskimo pottery had been found in mounds on the arctic coast those had been treasured but here were perfect specimens, such as any museum in the world would covet. And yet, had she but known it, the rareness and value of some of these were to exceed her fondest dreams. But the discovery was to come later. Drawing off her calico parka, Marian tied it at the top, and using it as a sack, carefully packed all the articles. Let's go back, she said in an awed whisper. Eh, eh, Atatak answered. There was a strange spookiness about the place that made them half afraid to remain any longer. They had turned to go where Marion, chancing to glance down, saw the bit of ivory they had found by the outer campfire. At first she was tempted to let it remain where it lay. It seemed an insignificant thing after the discovery of these rarer treasures. But finally she picked it up and thrust it into her bag. Well for her that she did. Later it was to prove the key to a mystery, an entirely new mystery which as yet had not appeared above their horizon, but was, in a way, associated with the mystery of the purple flame. Listen, said Marian, as they came nearer to the mouth of the cave, I do believe the storm is passing. Perhaps we can get off the mountain today. Oh, at attack we'll win yet. Won't that be glorious? It was true the storm was passing. At attack was dispatched to investigate, and soon came hurrying back with the report that they could be on their way as soon as they had eaten breakfast and packed. 
Marian was possessed with a wild desire to inspect her newly discovered treasure, to wash, scrub, and scrape it, and try to discover how it was made, and what it was made of. Yet she realized that any delay for such a cause would be but criminal folly. So, after a hasty breakfast, she rubbed as much dust as she could from the strange treasures, and packed them carefully in the folds of the sleeping bags. Soon the girls found themselves beside their deer, picking their way cautiously forward over the remaining distance to the divide. Then quite as cautiously they started down the other side. During the day they halted for a cold lunch while their reindeer fed on a broad plateau, a protected place where they were safe from the wild blizzards of the peaks that loomed far above them. From now on, said Marian, there will be little rest for us. Our bold stroke has saved us nothing. It is now a question of whether reindeer are trustworthy steeds in the Arctic, also whether girls are capable of solving problems and of enduring many hardships. As for me, she shook her fist in the general direction of Scarberry's herd. I say they are. We'll win. See if we don't. To this declaration, Attatak uttered an eh eh, which to Marion sounded like a fervent Amen. End of chapter 12Chapter Thirteen of the Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Thirteen, The Long Trail. At nightfall of the following day, worn from the constant travel and walking as if in their sleep, the two girls came to the junction of the two forks of a modest-sized river. The frozen stream, coated as it was by a hard crust of snow, had given them a perfect trail over the last ten miles of travel. Before that, they had crossed endless tiers of low-lying hills, whose hard-packed and treacherously slippery slides had brought grief to them and to their reindeer. Twice an overturned sled had dragged the reindeer off his feet, and reindeer, sled and driver had gone rolling and tumbling down the hill, to be piled in a heap in the gully below. Those had been trying hours, but now they were looking forward to many miles of smooth going between the banks of this river. First, however, there must be rest and food for them and for their deer. They were watching the shelving bank for some likely place to camp, where there was shelter from the biting wind and driftwood lodged along the bank for a fire. Then, with a little cry of surprise, Marian pointed at a bend in the river. At this point, she said, the river runs southwest. Attatak looked straight down the river and at the low sweeping banks beyond, then uttered a low, eh, eh, in agreement. That means that we cannot follow the river, said Marian. Our course runs northwest. Every mile travelled on the river takes us off our course and lessens our chance of reaching our goal in time. What shall we do? asked Attatak in perplexity. Let me think, said Marian. There is time enough to decide. We must camp here. The deer must have food and rest. So must we. There is not much danger of wolves. If any come prowling around, the deer will let us know soon enough. We will sleep on our sleds, and if anything goes wrong, the deer, tethered to the sleds, will tumble us out of our beds. Anyway, they will waken us. Soon supper was over. The deer, having had their fill of moss dug from beneath the snow, had lain down to rest. The girls spread their sleeping bags out upon the sleds and prepared for a few hours of much-needed rest. Attatak, with the carefree unconcern that is characteristic of her race, had scarcely buried her face in the improvised pillow when she was fast asleep. Sleep did not come so quickly to Marian. Many matters of interest lingered in her mind. It was as if her mind were a room all littered up with the odds and ends of a day's work. She must put it to rights before she could sleep. She thought once more of the strange treasures they had brought from the cave. Tired as she was, she was tempted to get out those articles and look at them, and to brush them up a bit and see what they were like. I know it's foolish, she told herself, but it's exactly as if I had hung up my stocking on Christmas Eve, and then when Christmas morning came, had been obliged to seize my stocking 
without so much as a glance inside and forced to start at once on a long journey which would offer me no opportunity to examine my stocking until the journey was at an end but i won't look not now it's too cold Brr, she shivered as she drew herself farther down into the furry depths of her sleeping bag she was reminded of the time she and patsy had slept together beneath the stars she could not help wishing that patsy was with her now sharing her sleeping bag and looking up at the gleaming milky way she wondered vaguely how patsy was getting on with the herd but the thought did not greatly disturb her she was about to drift off to the land of dreams when a thought popped into her mind that brought her up wide awake again their morning's course was not yet laid what should it be she closed her eyes and tried to think then like a flash it came to her it's the hard way she whispered to herself seems as if it were always the hard way that is safe and sure the thought that had come to her was this in order to reach their destination they must still travel several miles north the river they were following flowed southwest to go south was to go out of their way were they to strike due north across country they might in the course of a day's travel come to another stream which did not angle toward the south that would mean infinitely hard travel over snow that was soft and yielding and across tundra whose frozen caribou bogs were as rough as a cordwood road it's the long hard way she sighed but we may win if we follow this river we never can then with all her problems put in order she fell asleep End of chapter 13chapter 14 of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 14 mysterious music two days later marion and attatak found themselves tramping slowly along behind their tired deer it was night now and again the moon shot a golden beam of light across their trail for the most part that trail was dark overshadowed by great spruce and fir trees that stood out black against the whiteness of the snow each tree seeming a gown clad monk silent witnesses of their passing there was now a definitely marked trail an axe cut here and there on a tree told them this trail had been made by men and not by moose and caribou they had seen no traces of man no human habitation had sent its gleam of light across their trail to bid them welcome scarcely knowing whether she wished to see the light of a cabin marion tramped doggedly on it was long past camping time yet she feared to make camp several times she had caught the long-drawn howl of a wolf faint and indistinct in the distance with a burst of joy and hope she thought of the progress they had made the tramp across open tundra had been fearfully hard they had however reaped from it a rich reward the river they had found was larger than the other and its surface had offered an almost perfect trail it flowed north by west instead of southwest it took them directly on their way even now marion was wondering if this was not the very river at whose junction with the great yukon was located the station they sought to reach before the government agent had passed if it is she murmured what can hinder us from making the station in time it seemed that there could be but one answer to this yet in the arctic there is no expression that is so invariably true as this one you never can tell then suddenly marion's thoughts were drawn to another subject a peculiar gleam of moonlight among the trees reminded her of the purple flame at once she began wondering what could be the source of that peculiar and powerful light who possessed it and what their purpose was in living on the tundra and patsy she questioned herself i wonder if they are troubling her wonder if they are really living off our deer i wish i had not been obliged to leave our camp seems that there were problems enough without this i wish suddenly she put out one hand and stopped her deer while with the other she gave attatak a mute signal for silence breaking gently through the hushed stillness of the forest 
like a spring zephyr over a meadow there came to her ears a sound of wonderful sweetness music she breathed and such music the very music of heaven moments passed and still with slightly bowed heads as if listening to the angelus they stood there still as statues listening to the strange music the woods were god's first temples marian whispered for the moment she lived as in a trance a great lover of music she felt the thrill of perfect melody breaking over her soul like bright waves upon golden sand she fancied that this melody had no human origin that it was a spontaneous outburst from the very heart of the forest god himself speaking through the mute life of earth when this illusion had passed she still stood there wondering attack what day of the week is this for a moment attack did not answer she was counting on her fingers sunday she said at last sunday marian repeated and that is a pipe organ how wonderful how perfectly beautiful a pipe organ in the midst of the forest and yet she hesitated scarcely daring to believe her senses how could a pipe organ be brought way up here but it is she affirmed a few seconds later at attack you watch the deer while i go ahead and find out what sort of place it is and whether there are dangerous dogs about her wonder grew with every step that she took in the direction of the mysterious musician as she came closer and the tones became more distinct she knew that she could not be mistaken it's a pipe organ she told herself with conviction and a splendid one at that who in all the world would bring such a wonderful instrument away up here strange i have never heard of this settlement it must be a rather large village or they could not afford such an organ for their church as she thought of these things and as the rise and fall of the music still came sweeping through the trees a strange spell fell upon her it was as if she were resting upon the soft cushioned seat of some splendid church with the service appealing to her sense of the artistic and the beautiful and to her instinct of reverence with the soft lights pervading all she was again in the chapel of her own university oh she cried i do hope it's a real church and that we're not too late for the service one thought troubled her as she hurried forward if this was a large village where were the tracks of dog teams that must surely be traveling up the river trappers going out over their lines of traps hunters seeking caribou prospectors starting away over the trail for a fresh search for the ever elusive yellow gold surely all these would have left a well-beaten trail yet since the last snow there had not been a single team passing that way it's like a village for the dead she mused and shivered at the thought when at last she rounded a turn and came within full sight of the place from which the enchanting tones issued the sight that met her eyes caused her to start back and stare with surprise and amazement she had expected to find a cluster of log cabins a store a church and a school instead she saw a yawning hole in a bank of snow a hole that was doubtless an entrance to some sort of structure whether the structure was built of sod, logs, or merely snow, she could not guess. Some thirty feet from this entrance, and higher, apparently perched on the crust of snow, were two such cupola affairs as Marian had seen on certain types of sailing vessels and gasoline schooners. From these there streamed a pale yellow light. Well, she exclaimed, well, of all things! For a moment, undecided whether to flee from that strange place she stood stock still the organ for the moment was stilled the woods were silent such a hush as she had never experienced in all her life lay over all then faint indistinct came a single note of music someone had touched a key the next instant the world seemed filled with the most wonderful melody handel's largo she whispered as she stood there enchanted of all pipe organ music she loved handel's largo best throughout the rendering of the entire selection 
she stood as one enchanted it is enough she said when the sound of the last note had died away in the treetops it's all very mysterious but any person who can play handel's largo like that is not going to be unkind to two girls who are far from home i'm going in with unfaltering footsteps she started forward End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of The Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 15 An Old Man of the North. Having walked resolutely to the black hole in the snowbank, Marian looked within. There was no door, merely an opening here. A dim lamp in the distance sent an uncertain and ghostly light down the corridor. By this light she made out numerous posts and saw that a narrow passageway ran between them. There was something so mysterious about the place that she hesitated on the threshold. At that moment a thought flashed through her mind, a startling and disheartening thought. Radio, she murmured, nothing but radio. She was convinced in an instant that her solution of the origin of the wonderful music was correct. The persons who lived in this strange dwelling, which reminded her of pictures she had seen of the dens and caves of robbers and brigands, had somehow come into possession of a powerful radio receiving set. Somewhere in Nome, or Fairbanks, or perhaps even in Seattle, a noted musician was giving an organ recital. This radio set, with its loudspeaker, had picked up the music and had faithfully reproduced it. That was all there was to the mystery. There was no pipe organ, no skilful musician out here in the forest wilderness. It had been stupid of her to think there might be. This revelation, for revelation it surely seemed to be, was both disappointing and disturbing. Disappointing because in her adventure-loving soul she had hoped to discover here in the wilderness a thing that to all appearances could not be, a modern miracle. Disturbing it was, too, for since a mere instrument, a radiophone, has no soul the character of the person who operated it might be anything at all she could not conceive of the person who actually touched the keys and caused that divine music to pour forth as a villain any sort of person however might snap on the switch that sends such music vibrating from the horn of the loudspeaker of a radiophone for a full five minutes she wavered between two courses of action to go inside this den or to go back to Atatak and attempt to pass it unobserved. Perhaps it was the touch of a finger on what she supposed to be a far-off key, the resuming of the music. Perhaps it was her own utter weariness that decided her at last. Whatever it was, she set a resolute foot inside the entrance, and the next instant found herself carefully picking her way down the dark passage toward the dim lamp. To her surprise, when she at last reached the lamp that hung over a door, she found not an oil lamp, but a small electric light bulb. Will marvels never cease? she whispered. For a second she hesitated. Should she knock? She hated spying. Yet the door stood invitingly ajar. If the persons within did not appear to be the sort of persons a girl might trust, if she could see them and remain unobserved, there was still opportunity for flight. Acting upon this impulse, she peered through the crack in the door. Imagine her surprise upon seeing at the far end of a long, high-ceilinged, heavily timbered room, not a radio horn, but a pipe organ. So, she breathed, my first thought was right. That enchanting music was produced on the spot, and by such a musician. Seated with his side toward her, was the bent figure of an old man his long flowing white beard his snowy locks the dreamy look upon his face as his fingers drifted back and forth across the keys reminded her of pictures she had seen of ancient bards playing upon golden harps harp of the north that mouldering long has hung she recited in a low voice the fingers on the keys suddenly ceased their drifting the dreamy look faded from the musician's face a smile lighted his eyes as turning about 
he spoke in a cheery voice come in i have been waiting for you you are welcome to an old man's lonely house doubly welcome coming as you do in time for sunday vespers this strange almost uncanny proceeding so startled the girl that for a second she was tempted to turn and flee the next second she had complete control of herself pushing the door open as if entering the chamber of the king of fairies she made a little bow and said thank you then realizing how perfectly absurd her action had been she broke into a hearty laugh and in this laugh the old man joined so with the ice broken they became friends at once to her vast relief she found that the old man though he had undoubtedly been expecting them or someone else did not know all about them he asked if they traveled with dog team or reindeer upon being told that they drove reindeer he smiled and said good it's lucky i have feed for your deer reindeer people seldom come this way once i was caught unprepared to entertain them so last autumn i put in a good stock of moss and willow leaves your deer shall be safely housed and richly fed and so shall you go bring them at once or shall i go with you oh no that is not necessary marian hastened to assure him very well then while you go i will put the birds on to broil you are doubtless very hungry ten minutes later marian was chattering to attatak the queerest place you ever saw and the strangest old gentleman but really i think he is a deer End of chapter 15chapter 16 of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 16 the barrier the curiosity of the two girls knew no bounds as they neared the strange abode who was this man why did he live here all by himself how had he brought his pipe organ to this remote spot whence had come those peculiar skylights through which the yellow light gleamed whence came the power for those electric lights how had this strange man known of their coming or had he known had he been expecting someone else and had he as a perfect host pretended it was marian he had known to be at the door these and many other questions flashed through marian's alert mind as she guided her deer over the remaining distance and up to the entrance of the cave-like structure lights flashed on here and there as they passed inside a long corridor walled on either side by hewn logs led to a stall-like room where was food in abundance for their reindeer and what was better still perfect protection from any night prowler marian was wondering what sort of a meal was being prepared for them when they were at last led into a large room here on the side opposite the pipe organ great logs crackled merrily in a fireplace half as wide as the room itself after taking their fur parkas the host motioned them to seats beside the fire there charmed by the drowsy warmth marian experienced great difficulty in keeping awake strange fancies floated through her mind she fancied she was aboard a ship at sea the walls about her were the walls of her stateroom the huge beams above the ship's beams the strange couple of affairs above the lights to her cabin as she shook herself free from this fancy she realized that aside from the fireplace the inside of the room was very like a cabin of a high-class schooner it must all come from some vessel she reasoned even the lighting fixtures look as if they had been taken from a ship i wonder what ship and why she thought of stories she had read of beachcombers who wrecked ships by displaying fake shore lights on stormy nights that they might gather the wreckage from the beach for a moment she fancied this bearded patriarch playing such a role finding this too absurd even for fancy she shook herself free from it food she murmured to herself i'm ravenously hungry he spoke of putting on the birds i wonder what he could have meant she did not have long to wait a moment later there came to her nostrils the delicious aroma of perfectly brewed coffee mingled with it were various savory odors which gave promise of a rich meal 
You are not yet fully warmed said their host so you may eat by the fire He was pushing before him a tea wagon of wonderful design and craftsmanship This was fairly creaking under its load of chinaware of exquisite design and silver which did not require a second look to tell that it was sterling Marion barely avoided a gasp at sight of it if the service was perfect the food was no less so four ptarmigan those wonderful quail of the arctic broiled to a delicious turn were flanked with potatoes gravy peas and apple sauce the dessert was blueberries preserved in wild honey only idleness or indifference smiled their host as he caught their looks of appreciation can hinder one from securing appetizing foods in any land and now he said as they finished there are questions you may wish to ask information that you may wish to impart why we marian began in some confusion he interrupted her with a wave of the hand it will all keep until morning this habit young people have of sitting up talking all hours of the night because life seems too exciting for sleep is all wrong you are in need of rest everything in its good time is my motto fortunately my guest room is warm the fire is not yet burned out last night i had the honor of furnishing a night's lodging to the agent of our government the agent marian asked in surprise yes he came up here to ask me about the lay of the land above here i think there was a merry twinkle in his eye that i may lay claim to being the oldest resident of this town no doubt i was able to give him some valuable information and he is is gone marian gasped left this morning why did you wish to see him surely yes you would being connected with the reindeer business you would unfortunate that you did not reach here a few hours earlier he left on foot the trail around the rapids is rough he did not try to bring his dogs and sleds through he left them with his driver at the foot of the rapids well enough that he did couldn't have made it upon realizing that she had missed the man she had come so far to see marian could have burst into tears you may find him at the station though her host assured her i believe he means to stay there a day or two his dogs are footsore from traveling over crushed snow marian's heart gave a leap of joy but what was this about the trail and the rapids did did you say that one could not pass over the trail with a sled she asked in the calmest tone she could command are the rapids not yet frozen over frozen he stared at her incredulously have you not heard them and then you came from upstream the forest shuts out the sound slip on your parka and come with me and you shall hear it is grand music that ceaseless rush and roar that beating of waters and tumbling of ice it may have seemed glorious to the old man but to marian who listened to the wide tumult of waters it was frightening and disheartening can a boat run the rapids she asked though she knew the question was foolish and that no boat could run them none ever has can can a sled pass over the trail above none has none can the way is too rough the trees too closely crowded together dogs reindeer men yes but sleds no how far is it to the station marian faltered three days journey are there any houses on the way none then without our sleds we would not dare undertake the journey no nope, it would not do you would starve or freeze it required all marian's power of will to remain standing as she faltering said then we are defeated we we must turn back we she could not go on the aged man studied her face for a moment then quietly he asked is it very important that you get to the station that you see the agent oh very very important we again he motioned for silence do not tell me now i think it can be arranged that your sleds may pass the rapids it shall be arranged i promise it come you are worn out it is time you should sleep End of chapter 16
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 17 Age Serves Youth. The two girls had carried no suitcase, satchel, or duffel bag on this trip. Their spare clothing was stowed away in their sleeping bags. When their host had lighted their way to the room that was to be theirs for the night, and had retired to his large room, they tiptoed back to their sleds, unlashed their sleeping bags, and carried them, as they were, to their room. For some hours Marion had not thought of the ancient treasure found in the cave, but once she began unrolling her sleeping bag she was reminded of it. A piece of old ivory went clattering to the floor. With a cry of surprise she picked it up, then carefully removed the other pieces of ivory, copper, and ancient pottery, and stood them in a row against the wall. Again there came the temptation to give them a thorough examination. Events transpired later that caused her to wish that she had done so, but weary and troubled by the turn affairs had taken, she again put off this inviting task. She slipped at once into her sleeping gown and plunged beneath the covers of the most delightful bed she had ever known. At attack followed her a few seconds later. They found themselves lying upon a bed of springy moss mixed with the fragrant tips of balsam. Over this had been thrown wolfskin robes. With one of these beneath them, and two above, they snuggled down until only their noses were showing. They did not sleep at once. Left to himself, the mysterious old man had seated himself at his organ, and now sent forth such wild, pealing tones as Marion had never heard before. He was doing Borjac's wildest symphony, and making it wilder and more weird than even the composer himself could have dreamed it might be made. Throughout its rendition, Marion lay tense as a bowstring. As it ended with a wild, racing crash, she settled back with a shiver, wondering what could throw such a spell over an old man as would cause him to play in that manner. Had he known the reason, she would have done little sleeping that night. The aged host was tuning his soul to such a key as would nerve him for a Herculean task. Since Marion did not know, she puzzled for a time over the trail they must travel in the morning, wondered vaguely how her host was to keep his promise of bringing their sleds safely past the rapids, then fell asleep. As for their host, fifteen minutes after the last note of his wild symphony had died away, he tiptoed down the silent corridor which led to the door of the room in which the girls were sleeping. Having convinced himself by a moment of listening that they were asleep, he made his way to the spot where their two sleds had been left. These he examined carefully. After straightening up, he murmured, Took their sleeping bags. That's bad. Didn't need them. Can't disturb them now. Guess it can be managed. After delivering himself of this monologue, he proceeded to wrap the contents of each sled in a waterproof blanket, then dragged them out into the moonlight. Having strapped an axe, a pick, and a shovel on one sled, he tied the other sled to it and began pulling them over the smooth downhill trail that led toward the falls. For a full mile he plodded stolidly on. Then he halted, separated the sleds, and with the foremost sled gliding on before him, plunged down a steep bank to the right. Presently he came toiling back up the hill for the other sled. At the bottom once more, he stood for a moment, staring into the foaming depths of the roaring torrent. Pretty bad, he muttered. Never did it before at this time of year. Might fail, might... Suddenly he broke off and began humming. tum ti tum 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 He was going over and over that mad symphony. It appeared to give him strength and courage, and seizing the pick, he began hacking away at some object that lay half buried in the snow. Fifteen minutes later, he had exhumed a short, square raft. "'Built you for other purposes, but you'll do for this,' he muttered. "'Other logs where you came from.' He set both sleds carefully upon the raft, then, with yards upon yards of rawhide rope, lashed them solidly to it. This done, he began running out a heavier rope. This he carried up the bank to a spot where there was a mass of jagged rock, covered here and there by hard-packed snow. 
More than once he slipped, but always he struggled upward until at last he stood upon the topmost pinnacle. A heroic figure silhouetted in the moonlight, he stood for a full five minutes staring down at the racing waters below. Dancing in the moonlight, they appeared to reach out black hands to grasp and drag him down. Before him, on the opposite side, gleamed a high white bank, a sheer precipice of ice fifty feet high. This was the end of a glacier that every now and again sent a thousand tons of ice thundering into the deep pool at its foot. Beneath this ice barrier, the water had worn a channel. A boat drifting down on the rushing waters would certainly be sucked down beneath this ice and be crushed like an eggshell. What the old man intended to do was evident enough. He meant to set the raft, laden with the sleds and trappings so precious to his young guests, afloat in those turbulent waters, and then to attempt by means of the rope to hold it from being drawn beneath the ice, and to guide it a half mile down the river to quieter waters below. There was no path for him to follow. Jagged rocks and ice-like snow, slippery as glass, awaited him. Yet he dared to try it. Here was a task fit for the youngest and the strongest, yet there he stood, the spirit of a hero flowing in his veins, age serving youth. The gallantry of a great and perfect gentleman bowing to fair ladies and daring all. How Marian would have thrilled at sight of this daring act. With a swift turn he tightened the rope, then with the dididum of his symphony upon his lips, strained every muscle until he felt the rope slack, then eased away as he saw the raft tilt for the glide. Then he relaxed his muscles and stood there watching. With a slow, graceful movement, the small raft glided out upon the water. An eddy seized it and whirled it about. Three times it turned, then the current caught it and whirled it away. The rope was tight now, and every muscle of the grand old man was tense. A battle had begun which was to decide whether or not the two girls were to reach the station and fulfil their mission. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson Chapter 18 the trail of blood that same evening patsy made her second startling discovery an hour before night was to set in she had harnessed the sled deer and struck out into the hills in search of a brown yearling that had been missing for two days strange where they all go she murmured as she climbed a hill for a better view of the surrounding country marian was right unless we discover the cause of these disappearances and put an end to them Soon there will be no herd. It's a shame. How I wish I could make the discovery all by myself and surprise Marian with the good news when she gets home. As she scanned the horizon away across to the west, she saw a single dark figure on the crest of the hill. Old Omnap Pook, she said, taking in with admiration the full sweep of his splendid antlers. It's the first time I've seen him for a long while. We can't lose you, can we? And we can't catch you, she said, speaking to the lone figure. Old Omnap Pook was neither reindeer nor caribou. At least this was what Marian had said about it. She believed that it was a crossbreed, half reindeer and half caribou. He was large like a caribou, larger than the largest deer in the herd. He had something of the dark brown coat of the caribou, but a bright white spot on his left side told of the reindeer blood that flowed in his veins. But he was very wild. Haunting the edge of the herd, he never came close enough to be lassoed or driven into a brush corral. Many a wild chase had he led the herders, but always he had shown them his sleek brown heels. Many times the girls had debated the question of allowing the herders to kill him for food and for his splendid coat, yet they had hesitated, they were not sure that he was not a full-blooded reindeer, that he was not marked and did not belong to someone. If he was a stray reindeer, they had no right to kill him. Besides this, it seemed a pity to kill such a wonderful creature. 
so the matter stood and here he was on their feeding ground as patsy stood there gazing at this splendid creature she slowly realized that the arctic sun had flamed down below the far horizon and long shadows raced out of the west a full orbed moon stood just atop the trees that lined the eastern rim of hills turning reluctantly to leave her eyes caught sight of a dark spot in the snow she bent over to examine it and a moment later straightened up with a startled exclamation blood it's a trail of blood i wonder which way it goes unable to answer this question she decided to circle until she could find some sign that would tell her whether or not she was backtracking satisfied at last of the direction she pushed on and there in the eerie moonlight through the ghostly silence of an arctic night she silently followed the trail of blood suddenly she stopped and stood still just before her was a large discoloration of the snow and though the snow was so wind-packed that she walked on it without snowshoes her keen eyes detected spots where it had been broken and scratched by some hard heavy object dropping on her knees she began examining every detail of the markings when she arose she spoke with a quiet tone of conviction here is the track of a man he has killed one of our deer and had been carrying it on his shoulder blood dropped from the still warm carcass that explains the trail of blood the load has become too heavy for him at this spot he has laid his burden down in places the antlers have scratched the snow after a time he has gone on but which way did he go once more she bent over on the hard packed snow the sole of a skin boot makes no tracks after a moment's study she again straightened up there's a long scratch as if he had dragged the carcass to his shoulder as he started on and the antler had dragged for two or three feet that would indicate that he went the way i have been going question is shall i go farther or shall i go for the herders with their rifles she decided to go on the blood spots grew less and less as she advanced she was beginning to despair of being able to follow much further when with a startled gesture she came to a sudden halt the purple flame she said in an awed whisper it was true as she stared down at a little willow-lined valley she saw the outline of a tent from the very centre of it there appeared to burst that weird purple light well she concluded I am at least sure that they've killed one of our deer killed several probably no doubt they have been living off our herd for a moment she stood there undecided then with reluctant feet she turned back it was the only wise thing to do she was alone and unarmed to follow that trail further would be dangerous and foolhardy but what should she do when she had reached her own camp she was convinced in her own mind that the slain creature was one of their deer yet she could not prove it should she lead her armed herders to the stranger's tent and demand an explanation oh how she did wish that marian was here as she walked homeward she felt terribly depressed there was a girl in that tent of the purple flame she had seen her she had hoped that sometime in the not too distant future they might be friends such a friend in this lonely land especially since marion and attatak were gone would be a boon indeed now she felt that such a thing could never be it was as if a great gulf had suddenly yawned between them after reaching her camp and sipping a cup of tea and munching at some hard crackers she sat for hours thinking things through her final decision was that for the present she could do nothing marion might return any day now in such matters her judgment would be best and patsy did not feel warranted in starting what might prove to be a dangerous feud end of chapter 18chapter 19 of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 19 passing the rapids as the raft which had been dragged from the bank of the river by the hermit of the mysterious lodge 
swung out into the ice-strewn current it shot directly for the glacier's end as if drawn by a magnet taking a quick turn of the rope about a point of rock the aged man braced himself for the shock which must come when the raft with its load of sleds and other trappings had taken up the slack all too soon it came bracing himself as best he could he held his ground the strain increased it seemed that the rope must snap that the old man's iron grip must yield should the raft reach the glacier it would be lost forever the muscle in the man's arms played like bands of steel blood vessels stood out on his temples like whip cords yet he held his ground ten seconds passed twenty thirty then with a whirl like some wild animal yielding to its captor the raft swung about and shot away down the stream plunging forward leaping rocks gliding over glassy surfaces of snow puffing perspiring the old man followed now he was down the cause seemed lost but in a flash he was up again clutching at a jagged rock that tore his hand for a second time he stayed the mad rush of the raft then he was on again bobbing from reef to reef plunging through foam leaping high above the torrents the raft went careering on twice it all but turned over and but for the skill of its master would have been crushed by great grinding cakes of ice for thirty long minutes the battle lasted minutes that seemed hours to the aged man then with a sigh he guided the raft into a safe eddy of water sinking down upon a hard packed bank of snow he lay there as if dead for a long time he lay there then rising stiffly made his way down the ledge to drag the raft ashore and unleash the sleds after this he drew the sleds up the hill one at a time and set them across the blazed trail there he sighed a good night's work done and a neat one i could not have done it better twenty years ago grow old along with me he threw back his hair as if in defiance of raging torrents the best is yet to be the last of life for which the first was made having delivered this bit of poetical oration to the tune of the booming rapids he turned to pick his way back over the uncertain trail that led to his strange abode eight hours after she had crept into the luxurious bed in the guest room of the strange lodge marian stirred then half awake felt the drowsy warmth of wolfskin rugs for a moment she lay there and inhaled the drug-like perfume of balsam and listened to the steady breathing of the eskimo girl beside her she was about to turn over for another sleep when from some cell of her brain where it had been stowed the night before there came the urge that told her she must make haste 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 came beating in upon her drowsy senses it was as if her brain were a radio and the message was coming from the air suddenly she sat bolt upright at the same instant she found herself wide awake fully alert and conscious of the problems she must face that day the passing of the rapids and covering a long span of that trail which still lay between them and their goal she did not waken at attack that might not be necessary for another hour she sprang out upon the heavy bearskin rug and there went through a set of wild whirling gestures that limbered every muscle in her body and sent the red blood racing through her veins after that she quickly slipped into her blouse knickers stockings and deerskin boots to at last go tiptoeing down the corridor toward the large living room where she heard the roar of the open fire as it raced up the chimney she found her host sitting by the fire in the uncertain light he appeared haggard and worn as if quite done in from some great exertion of course marian could not so much as guess how he had spent the night she had slept through it all with a smile of greeting the old man motioned her to a seat beside him you'll not begrudge an old man a half hour's company he said indeed not you'll wish to ask me things everyone who passes this way wants to mostly they ask and i don't tell a fair lady though there was something of ancient gallantry in his tone fair ladies usually ask what they will and get it too 
For a moment he sat staring silently into the fire. This house, he said at last, is a bit unusual. That pipe organ, for instance, you wouldn't expect it here. It came here as if by accident. Providence, I call it. A rich young man had more things than he knew what to do with. The creator sent some of them to me. As for me, I came here voluntarily. You have probably taken me for a prospector. I have never bought pick nor pan. There are things that lure me, but gold is not one of them. I had troubles before I came here. Troubles are the heritage of the aged. I sometimes think that it is not well to live too long. And yet, he shook himself free of the mood, his face lighting up as he exclaimed, And yet, life is very wonderful, wonderful even up here in the frozen north. I might almost say, especially here in the north. I came here to be alone. I brought in food with a dog team. I built a cabin of logs, and here I lived for a year. One day, a young man came up the river in a wonderful pleasure yacht, and anchored at the foot of the rapids. Being a lover of music, he had built a pipe organ into his yacht, the one you heard last night. And did, did he die? Marian asked, a little break coming in her voice. No, the old man smiled. He tarried too long. Being a lover of nature, a hunter and an expert angler, and having found the most ideal spot in the world as long as summer lasted, he stayed on after the frosts and the first snow. I was away at the time, else I would have warned him. I returned the day after it happened. There had been a heavy freeze far up the river. Then a storm came that broke the ice away. The ice came rushing down over the rapids like mad, and wrecked his wonderful yacht beyond all repair. We did as much as we could about getting the parts on shore, saved almost all but the hull. He stayed with me for a few days, then, becoming restless, traded me all there was left of his boat for my dog team. That winter, with the help of three Indians and their dogs, I brought the wreckage up here. Gradually, little by little, I have arranged it into the form of a home that is as much like a boat as a house. The organ was unimpaired, and here it sings to me every day of the great white winter. He ceased speaking and for a long time was silent. When he spoke again, his tones were mellow with kindness and a strange joy. I am seldom lonely now. The woods and waters are full of interesting secrets. Travellers like you come this way now and again. I try to be prepared to serve them, to be their friend. May, may I ask one question? Marion suggested timidly. As many as you like. How did you know I was at the door last night when you were playing? You did not see me. You couldn't have heard me. That, he smiled, is a question I should like to ask someone myself, someone much wiser than I am. I knew you were there. I had been feeling your presence for more than an hour before you came. I knew I had an audience. I was playing for them. How did I know? I cannot tell. It has often been so before. Perhaps all human presence can be felt by some specially endowed persons. It may be that in the throngs of great cities the message of soul to soul is lost. Just as a radio message is lost in a jumble of many messages sent at once. But then, he laughed, why speculate? Life's too short. Some things we must accept as they are. What's more important to you is that your sleds are beyond the rapids. When breakfast is over... You can strap your sleeping bags on your deer, and I will guide you over the trail round the rapids to the point where I left your sleds. A look of consternation flashed over Marion's face. She was thinking of the ancient dishes and how fragile they were. I have some fragile articles in the sleeping bags, she said. They, they might break. Break? He wore a puzzled look. For a second she hesitated, then reassured by the kindly face of the gentle old man, decided to tell him the story of their adventure in the cave. Then she launched into the story with all the eagerness of a discoverer. I see, he said, when she had finished the story. I know just how you feel. However, there is now only one safe thing to do. Leave these treasures with me. 
if the rapids are frozen over when the time comes for the return trip you can pass here and get them you'll always be welcome better leave an address to which they may be sent in case you should not pass this way the rapids freeze over every winter i will surely be able to get them off on the first river boat they can be sent to any spot in the world to attempt to pack them over your deer would mean certain destruction reluctant as marian was to leave the treasure behind she saw the wisdom of his advice so feeling a perfect confidence in him she decided to leave her treasure in his care then she gave him her address in nome with instructions for shipping should she fail to return this way one thing more i wanted to ask you she said how many men are there at the station one man the trader he stays there the year round one man she exclaimed one is all time was when there were twenty prospectors traders indians trappers two years ago forest fires destroyed the timber the game sought other feeding grounds and the trappers traders and indians went with them gold doesn't seem to exist in the streams hereabout so the prospectors have left too now one man keeps the post sort of holding on i guess just to see if the old days won't return do you suppose he could could leave for a week or two marian faltered guess not company wouldn't permit it then then marian set her lips tight she would not worry this kind old man with her troubles the fact remained however that if there was but one man at the station and he could not leave there was no one who would be delegated by the government agent to go back with her to help fight her battles against scarberry suddenly as she thought of the weary miles they had travelled of the hardships they had endured and of the probability that they would after all fail in fulfilling their mission she felt very weak and as one who has suddenly grown old end of chapter 19chapter 20 of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 20 a message from the air a cup of perfect coffee followed by a dash into the bracing arctic morning completely revived marian's spirits casting one longing look backward at the mysterious treasure of ancient dishes and old ivory throwing doubt and discouragement to the winds with energy and courage she set herself to face the problems of the day the passing of the rapids by the overland trail was all that their host had promised struggling over rocky snow-packed slopes slipping sliding buffeted by strong winds beaten back by swinging overhanging branches of ancient spruce and firs they made their way pantingly forward until at last with a little cry of joy marian saw their own sleds in the trail ahead that's over she breathed how thankful i am that we did not attempt to make it with the sleds or with our treasure on the backs of the deer there would not have been left a fragment of our dishes as big as a dime as for the sleds well it simply couldn't be done no me sighed at attack i wonder how he could have brought them by the rapids Marian mused as she examined the sleds There were flakes of ice frozen to the runners She could only guess at the method he had used only dimly picture the struggling it must have taken Even as she attempted to picture the night battle a great wave of admiration and trust swept over her The treasure is safer in his hands than in ours she told herself But after it has left his hands questioned her doubting self Oh well she sighed at last what must be will be the important thing after all is to reach the station before the agent has started on his way again her brow clouded what if there was no one to go back with her to dispel this doubt she hastened to hitch her deer to her sled soon they were racing away over the trail causing the last miles of their long journey to melt away like ice in the river before a spring thaw in the meantime a third startling revelation had come to patsy 
First, she had discovered that at least one of the persons connected with the strange purple flame was a girl. Next, she had found the red trail of blood that apparently was made by one of Marion's slain deer, and which led to the door of their tent. The third discovery had nothing to do with the first two, nor with the purple flame. It was of a totally different nature, and was most encouraging. If only Marion were here, she said to herself as she paced the floor, after receiving the important message. The message came to her over the radio phone. It was not meant particularly for her, nor for Marion. It was just news, not much more than a rumour at that. Yet such news as it was, if only it were true. Faint and far away it came drifting in upon the air from some powerful sending station. Perhaps that station was Fairbanks, Dawson, or Nome. She missed that part of the message. Only this much came to her that night as she sat at their compact, powerful receiving set, beguiling the lonesome hours by catching snatches of messages from near and far. Rumour has it that the Canadian government plans the purchase of reindeer to be given to her Eskimo people on the north coast of the Arctic. Five or six hundred will be purchased as an experiment, if the plan carries. It seems probable that the deer purchased will be procured in Alaska. It is thought possible to drive herds across the intervening space and over the line from Alaska, and that in this way they may be purchased by the Canadian agent on Canadian soil. A call for such herds may be issued later over the radio, as it is well known that many owners of herds have their camps equipped with radio phones. There the message ended. It had left Patsy in a fever of excitement. Marion and her father wished to sell the herd. It was absolutely necessary to sell it if Marion's hope of continuing her education were not to be blasted. There was no market now for a herd in Alaska. In the future, as pastures grew scarcer and as herds increased in numbers, there would be still less opportunity for a sale. What a wonderful opportunity, Patsy exclaimed to sell the whole herd to a government that would pay fair prices and cash. And what a glorious adventure, to drive a reindeer herd over hundreds of miles of rivers, forests, tundra, hills and mountains, to camp each night in some spot where perhaps no man has been before. Surely that would be wonderful. Wonderful. Just at that moment there entered her mind a startling thought, Scarberry's camp too was equipped with a radio phone probably he too at this very moment was smiling at the prospect of selling six hundred of his deer he wanted to sell of course he did everyone did he would make the drive certainly he would and then she breathed pressing her hands to her fluttering heart then it will be a race a race between two reindeer herd a race over hundreds of miles of wilderness for a grand price what a glorious adventure! If only Marion were here, she sighed again. The message announcing the plans may come while she is gone. Then... She sat in a study for a long time. Finally, she whispered to herself, If the message comes while she is gone, if the opportunity is sure to be lost unless the herd starts as soon as the message comes, I wonder if I dare to start on the race with the herd, with Terragluna, and without Marion and Atatak, I wonder if I would. For a long time she sat staring at the fire. Perhaps she was attempting to read the answer in the flames. At last, with cheeks a trifle flushed, she sprang to her feet, did three or four leaps across the floor, and throwing off her clothing, crept between the deerskins in the strange little sleeping compartment. End of chapter 20Chapter Twenty One of the Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty One Fading Hopes. Just at dawn of a wonderfully crisp morning, Marian found herself following her reindeer over a trail that had recently been travelled by a dog team. She was just approaching the trading station where the questions that haunted her tired brain would be answered. Since leaving the cabin in the forest above the rapids, 
She and Attatak had travelled almost day and night. A half hour for a hasty lunch here and there, an hour or two for sleep and for permitting the deer to feed. That was all they had allowed themselves. An hour earlier, Marion had felt that she could not travel another mile. Then they had come upon the trail of the dog team, and realising that they were nearing their goal, her blood had quickened like a marathon racer's at the end of his long race. No longer feeling fatigue, she urged her weary reindeer forward. Contrary to her usually cautious nature, she even cast discretion to the winds and drove her deer straight toward the settlement. That there were dogs which might attack her deer she knew right well. That they were not of the species that attacked deer, or that they were chained, was her hope. So, with her heart throbbing, she rounded a sudden turn to find herself within sight of a group of low-lying cabins that at one time had been a small town. Now, as her aged host had said, it was a town in name only. She knew this at a glance. One look at the chimneys told her the place was all but deserted. No smoke, she murmured. Yes, one smoke, Attatak said, pointing. It was true. From one long cabin there curled a white wreath of smoke. For a moment Marian hesitated. No dogs had come out to bark, yet they might be there. You stay with the deer, she said to Attatak. Tether them strongly to the sleds. If dogs come, beat them off. She was away like an arrow, straight to that cabin of the one smoke she hurried. She caught her breath as she saw a splendid team of dogs standing at the door. Someone was going on a trip. The sled was loaded for the journey. Was it the agent's sled? Had she arrived in time? She did not have long to wait before knowing. She had come within ten feet of the cabin when a tall, deep-chested man opened the door and stepped out. She caught her breath. Instantly she knew him. It was the agent. He, in turn, recognized her, and with cap in hand and astonishment showing in his eyes, he advanced to meet her. "'You here?' he exclaimed. "'Why, Marion Norton, you belong in Nome.' "'Once I did,' she smiled. "'But now I belong on the tundra with our herd. "'It is the herd that has brought me here. "'May I speak to you about it?' "'Certainly you may, but you look tired and hungry. "'The trader has a piping mulligan stew on the stove. "'It will do you good. Come inside.' "'An Indian boy who made his home with the trader "'was dispatched to relieve Attatak of her watch.' and Marion sat down to enjoy a delicious repast. There are some disappointments that come to us so gradually that though the matters they affect are of the utmost importance, we are not greatly shocked when at last their full meaning is unfolded to us. It was so with Marion. She had dared and endured much to reach this spot. She had arrived at the critical moment. An hour later the agent would have been gone. The agent was her friend ready to do anything he could to help her he would gladly have gone back with her to assist in defending her rights but duty called him over another trail he had no one absolutely no one to send from this post to execute his orders of course he said after hearing her story i can give you a note to that outlaw scarberry but he'd pay no attention to it he'd tear it up and throw it in my face asserted marian stoutly "'I'll tell you what I'll do,' said the agent, rising and walking the floor. "'There is Ben Neighbor over at the foot of Sugarloaf Mountain. "'His cabin is only three days' travel from your camp. "'He's a good man and a brave one. "'He is a deputy marshal. "'If I give you a note to him, he will serve you as well as I could. "'Would we need to take a different trail home? "'Why, which way did you come?' "'Marion described their course. "'The agent whistled. It's a wonder you didn't perish. Here, he said, is a rough map of the country. I will mark out the course to Ben's cabin. You'll find it a much safer way. Oh, all right, she said slowly. Thanks, that's surely the best way. She was thinking of the treasure left at the cabin. She had hoped to return by that route and claim it. Now that hope was gone. End of chapter 21
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty Two A Fruitless Journey. It was night, such a night as only the Arctic knows. Cold stars, gleaming like bits of burnished silver in the sky, shone down upon vast stretches of glistening snow. Out of that whiteness, one object loomed, black as ink against the whiteness of its background. Weary with five days of constant travel, Marian found herself approaching this black bulk. She pushed doggedly forward, expecting at every moment to catch a lightning-like zigzag flash of purple flame shooting up the side of it. The black bulk was the old dredge in Sinrock River. She had passed that way twice before. Each time she had hoped to find there a haven of rest, and each time she had been frightened away by the flash of the purple flame. Those mysterious people had left this spot at one time. Had they returned? Was the dredge now a place of danger, or a haven for weary travellers? The answer to this question was only to be found by marching boldly up to the dredge. This called for courage. Born with a brave soul, Marian was equal to any emergency. Sheer weariness and lack of sleep added to this touch of daring. Without pausing, she drove straight up to the door. Reassured by the snow banked up against it, she hastily scooped away the bank with her snowshoe, and having shoved the door open, boldly entered. It was a cheerless place, black and empty. The wind whistled through the cracks where the planks had rotted away. Yet it was a shelter. Passing through another door, she found herself in an inner room that housed the boiler of the engine that had furnished power to the dredge. The boiler, a great red drum of rust, stood directly in front of her. Here's where we camp, she said to Atatak. We can build a fire in the firebox of the boiler and broil some steak. That will be splendid. It eh grinned Atatak. And Atatak, bring the deer through the outer door, then close it. They were fed two hours ago. That will do until morning. She lighted a candle, gathered up some bits of wood that lay strewn about the narrow room, and began to kindle a fire while Atatak went out after the deer. For the moment, being alone, she began to think of the herd. How was the herd faring? What had happened to Patsy during those many days of her absence? Were Bill Scarberry's deer rapidly destroying her herd ground? Well, if they are, we are powerless to prevent it, she told herself with a sigh. As she looked back upon it now, she felt that her whole journey had been a colossal failure. They had discovered the mountain cave treasure, only to be obliged to leave the treasure behind. They had reached the station in time to talk with the government agent, but he had not been able to come with her. Only twenty-four hours before they had reached the cabin of Ben Neighbor, only to find it dark and deserted. He had gone somewhere, as people in the Arctic have a way of doing, and where that might be she could not even hazard a guess. At last, in despair, she had headed her deer toward her own camp. In thirty-six hours she would be there. Well, at any rate, she sighed, it will be a pleasure to see Patsy and to sleep the clock round in our own sweet little deerskin bedroom. She was indeed to see Patsy, but the privilege of sleeping the clock round was not to be hers for many a day. She was destined to find the immediate future far too stirring for that. Twenty-four hours later saw Marian well on her way home. Ten hours more, she felt sure, would bring her to camp. And then what? She could not even guess. Had she been able to even so much as suspect what was going on at camp, she would have urged her reindeer to do their utmost. Patsy was right in the middle of a peck of trouble. Because of the fact that for the last few days she had been living in a realm of exciting dreams, the troubles that had come down upon her seemed all the more grievous. Since that most welcome radio message regarding the proposed purchase of reindeer by the Canadian government had come drifting in over the air, she had, during every available moment, hovered over the radio phone in the momentary expectation of receiving the confirmation of that rumour which might send the herd over mountains and tundra in a wild race for a prize, a prize worth thousands of dollars to her uncle and cousin, the sale of the herd. 
Perhaps it was because of her too close application to the radiophone that she failed to note the approach of Scarberry's herd, as it returned to ravish their feeding ground. Certain it was that the first of the deer, with the entire herd closing upon their heels, were already over the hills before she knew of their coming. It was night when Terragluna brought this bit of disquieting news. And this time... Patsy wailed. We have not so much as one hungry Eskimo with his dog to send against them. As if in answer to the complaint, the aged herder plucked at her sleeve, then led her out beneath the open sky. With an impressive gesture, he waved his arm toward the distant hills that lay in the opposite direction of Scarberry's herd. To her great surprise and mystification, she saw gleaming there the lights of twenty or more campfires. Ubogok, see there, he said. What, what does it mean? Patsy stammered, grasping at her dry throat. It is that I fear, said Terragluna. They come. Tomorrow they are here. You gave food for a week for a few. Flour, sugar, bacon. They like him. Now come whole village of Sitnizok. Want food. You gave them food. What you think? No food for herders. No herders. No herders. No herd. What you think? Patsy did not know what to think. Gone was all her little burst of pride over the way she had handled the other situation that had confronted her. Now she felt that she was but a girl, a very small girl, and very, very much alone. She wished Marion would come. Oh, how did she wish that she would come? In the morning we will see what can be done, was all she could say to the faithful old herder as she turned to re-enter the igloo. That night she did not undress. She sat up for hours trying to think of some way out. She sat long with the radio headset over her ears. She entertained some wild notion of fleeing with the herd toward the Canadian border, providing the message confirming the offer of the deer came. But the message did not come. At last, in utter exhaustion, she threw herself among the deerskins and fell into a troubled sleep. She was roused from this sleep by a loud, Hello there! followed by a cheery where are you are you asleep it was marian the next moment poor tired worried patsy threw herself sobbing into her cousin's strong arms there now said marian soothingly as patsy's sobbing ceased sit down and tell me all about it you're safe that's something your experiences can't have been worse than ours the eskimo bill scarberry's herd burst out patsy they're here all of them tell me all about it encouraged marian wait till i get my head set on said patsy more hopefully it's been due for days may come at any time what's due asked marian mystified wait i'll tell you one thing at a time let's get it all straight she began at the beginning and recited all that had transpired since marian had left camp when she came to tell of her discovery that one of the mysterious occupants of the tent of the purple flame was a girl, Marion's astonishment knew no bounds. When told of the bloody trail, Marion was up in arms. The camp of the purple flame must be raided at once. They would put a stop to that sort of thing. They would take their armed herders and raid that camp this very night. But wait! Patsy held up a warning finger. I am not half through yet. There is more, too much more. She was in the midst of recounting her experiences with the band of wandering Eskimo and Scarberry's herd when suddenly she clapped the radio receiver tightly to her ears and stopped talking. Then she murmured, It's coming. At last, it is coming. For goodness sake, exclaimed Marion, out of all patience, will you kindly tell me what is coming? but Patsy only held the receiver to her ears and listened the more intently as she whispered, Shush! Wait! End of chapter 22Chapter 23 Planning the Long Drive 
The message that was holding Patsy's attention was one from the Canadian government. It was a bona fide offer from that government to purchase the first herd of from four to six hundred reindeer that should reach Fort Jarvis. When Patsy had imparted the exciting news to her, Marion sat long in silent thought. Fort Jarvis, as she well knew, lay some five hundred miles away over hills and tundra. She had just returned from one such wearisome journey. Should she start again? And would this second great endeavor prove more successful than the first? Of all the herds in Alaska, two were closest to Fort Jarvis, Scarberry's and her own. She had not the slightest doubt that Scarberry would start driving a section of his herd toward that goal. It would be a race, a race that would be won by the bravest, strongest, and most skilful. Marion believed in her herders. She believed in herself and Patsy. She believed as strongly in her herd, her sled deer, and her dogs. It was a grand opportunity, the way out of all troubles. That the band of begging natives would not follow, she knew right well. Nor would the mysterious persons of the Purple Flame camp, at least she hoped not. As for their little herd range, if they sold their deer, Scarberry might have it, and welcome. If they did not sell, they could doubtless find pasture in some far away Canadian valley. Yes, she said in a tone of decision, we will go. We will waken the herders at once. Come on, let's go. As they burst breathlessly into the cabin of their Eskimo herders, they received something of a shock. Since all the work of the day had long since been done, they had expected to find the entire group of four assembled in the cabin, or asleep in their bunks. But there was only old Terragluna and Atatak. "'Where's Oatina? Where's Azuzruk?' demanded Marion. "'Gone,' said Terragluna solemnly. "'Where? Go call them, quick!' Terragluna did not move. He merely shrugged his shoulders and mumbled, "'No good!' Gone long way. Bill Scarberry's camp. No come back. Say that one. What? exclaimed Marion in consternation. Gone? Deserted us? Eh eh. Terragluna nodded his head. Say Bill Scarberry pay more money. More dear. Say that one, Olatina. That one, Azazruk. No good. That one Bill Scarberry, me think. He shook his head solemnly. Not listen, that one, Oatina, that one, Azazruk. Say one a go. Go, that's all. Then we can't start the herd, murmured Marion, sinking down upon a rolled-up sleeping bag. Yes, we will, she exclaimed resolutely. Terragluna, where are the rifles? Gone, he repeated like a parrot. Maybe you forget that one rifle belong herder boys. And your rifle, questioned Marion. Where is your rifle? Broke tuck. Hammer not won't come down hard. Not won't shoot that one rifle, mine. Marion was stunned with surprise and chagrin. She and Patsy returned silently to their igloo. Oh, that treacherous Bill Scarberry, she exploded. He has known this was coming. He knew our herders were energetic and capable. He thought if they remained with us, we might beat him to the prize. So he sent some spy over here to buy them away from us with promises of more pay. And now, asked Patsy, now he will drive his herd to Fort Jarvis and sell it, and our grand chance is gone for ever. No, exclaimed Patsy, he won't, he shall not. We will beat him yet. We are strong. Terragluna and Atatak are faithful. We have our three collies. We can do it. We will beat him yet. Our herd is better than his. It will travel faster. Oh, Marion, somehow, somehow, we must do it. It's your chance, your one big, wonderful opportunity. Yes, exclaimed Marion, suddenly fired by her cousin's hot-blooded southern enthusiasm. We will do it or perish in the attempt. It's to be a race, she exclaimed. A race for a wonderful prize, a race between two large herds of reindeer, over five hundred miles of hills, tundra, and forest. There may be wolves in the forest. In Alaska, dangers lurk at every turn. Rivers too rapid to freeze over, and blizzards and wild beasts. We will be terribly handicapped from the very start. 
but for father's sake we must try it for your father's and for your own sake murmured patsy and marian i have always believed that our great creator was on the side of those who are kind and just bill scarberry played us a mean trick perhaps god will somehow even the score an hour was spent in consultation with old terragluna his face became very sober at the situation but in the end with the blood of youth coursing eternally in his veins he sprang to his feet and exclaimed eh, eh, yes yes we will go before it is day we will be away you go sleep you must be very strong in the morning terragluna will have reindeer and sleds ready we will call to the dogs we will be away before the sun we will shout kuliamuk kuliamuk hurry hurry to dogs and reindeer we will beat that one bill yet you know what he exclaimed his face darkening like a thundercloud you know that mean man that one bill scarberry want my boy soquina work for him want pay him reindeer give him bad rifle very bad rifle want shoot my boy soquina shot at caribou so queena rifle go flash crutch just like that shoot black powder that rifle came in so queena's eyes that powder can't see that one almost lost to freeze that one so queena by and by find camp stay camp maybe five days can see not very good bill he say go herd reindeer so queena he say can't see maybe get lost maybe freeze he say bill very mad get out no good you go freeze who cares so queena come my house long way plenty starve plenty freeze no give reindeer that one so queena that one bill bad one that bill so me think beat bill sell reindeer herd white man think very good work hard maybe beat that one bill scarberry there came a look of determination to patsy's face such as marian had never seen there if that's the kind of man he is if he would send an eskimo boy half blinded by his own worthless rifle out into the snow and the cold then we must beat him we must we must said patsy vehemently that's exactly the kind of man he is said marian soberly we must beat him if we can but it will be a long hard journey they had hardly crept between their deerskins when patsy was fast asleep not so marian the full responsibility of this perilous journey rested upon her shoulders she knew too well the hardships and dangers they must face they must pass through broad stretches of forest where food for the deer was scarce and where lurking wolves worn down to mere skeletons by the scarcity of food might attack and scatter their herd beyond recovery they must cross high hills from whose summits the snow at times poured like smoke from volcanoes in circling sweeps hundred of feet in extent here there would be danger of losing their deer in some wild blizzard or having them buried beneath the snows of some thundering avalanche it's not for myself alone that i'm afraid she told herself it's for patsy patsy from kentucky who would have thought a girl from the sunny south could be so brave such a good sport at the thought of the courageous carefree manner in which patsy had insisted on the journey a lump rose in her throat and she brushed a hand hastily over her eyes and yet she asked herself ought i to allow her to do it she's younger than i and not so strong can she stand the strain again her mind took up the thought of the perils they must face there were wandering tribes of indians in the territory they must cross the skulking and oft-times treacherous Indians of the little sticks. What if they were to cross the path of these? What if a great band of caribou should come pouring down some mountain pass, and, having swallowed up their little herd, go sweeping on, leaving them in the midst of a great wilderness with only their sled deer to stand between them and starvation? As if dreaming of Marian's thoughts, Patsy suddenly turned over with a little sobbing cry, and wound her arms around marian what is it marian whispered patsy did not answer she was still asleep the dream soon passed her muscles relaxed and with a deep sigh she sank back into her place this little drama left marian in an exceedingly troubled state of mind 
We ought not to go, she told herself. We will not. Then from sheer exhaustion, she too fell asleep. Three hours before the tardy Arctic sunrise, she heard Terragluna pounding at their door. She found that sleep had banished fear, and that every muscle in her body and every cell of her brain was ready for action, eager to be away. As for Patsy, she could not dress half fast enough, so great was her desire for the wonderful adventure. End of chapter 23「twenty four of the Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter twenty four Camp Followers. It was just as Marian was tightening the ropes to the pack on her sled that, happening to glance away at a distant hill, she was reminded of Patsy's latest story of the Purple Flame. From the crest of that hill there came a purple flare of light. Quickly as it had come, just so quickly it vanished, leaving the hill a faint outline against the sky. The purple flame, she breathed. I wonder if we can leave those mysterious camp followers of ours behind. On the instant, a disturbing thought flashed through her mind. It caused an indignant flash of color to rise to her cheeks. I wonder, she said slowly, if those mysterious people are spies set by Bill Scarberry to dog our tracks. They may start with us, she smiled to herself, as she at last dismissed the subject from her mind, but unless they really are Bill Scarberry's spies and set to watch us, they'll never finish with us. Camp followers don't follow over five hundred miles of wild trail. They're not that fond of hard marching. In this conclusion, she was partly wrong. Just as the sun was painting the distant mountain peaks with a gleam of gold, the collies began to bark and the broad herd of reindeer moved slowly forward. Marion and Patsy touched their deer gently with the reins, and they were away. It was with a distinct feeling of homesickness that Marion turned to look back at the campsite. She had spent many happy hours there. Now she was leaving it, perhaps forever. What was more, she was leaving the tundra, the broad stretching deer pastures of the arctics should their enterprise succeed she would pass over one of the canadian trails southward to the states and back to the university should they fail she might indeed return to the tundra but she knew it could never be the same to her we must not fail she told herself clenching her hands tight and staring away at the magnificent panorama which lay before her we must not must not fail as she saw the reindeer, a mass of brown and white moving down the slope, a feeling of sadness swept over her. She had come to love these gentle and half-wild creatures of the north. She was especially fond of the sled deer, her three, the spotted one, the brown one, and the white. Many hundred miles she had driven them. Nowhere in the world, she was sure, could there be deer who covered more miles in a day, who were quicker to recognize the pull of rain, more willing to stomp the tiresome nights away at the end of their tethers. Dearest of all were the three collie dogs, gold, copper, and bronze, she whimsically named them, for their coats were just what their names indicated. Copper and bronze were young dogs. Gold was the pick of the three, an old, well-trained sheep dog. Accustomed to the sunny pastures of California, he had been brought to this cold and barren land to herd reindeer. With the sturdy devotion of his kind, he had endured the biting cold without a whimper, and had gnawed his toes, cut by the crusted snow, in silence. He had done the work assigned to him with a zeal and thoroughness that might have shamed many a human master. These two I must leave, she told herself. Worse than that, I am leading them out into wild desert. Within a week that beautiful herd may be hopelessly scattered. Our sled deers killed by wolves, our dogs, well, anyway, they will never desert us. Together we will fight it out to the bitter end. A lump came into her throat, then realizing that she was the commander of this expedition, and that it was unbecoming of commanders to betray emotion, she quickly conquered her feelings and gave herself over to the work of assisting in keeping the herb moving steadily forward in a compact mass. 
Five days later, with their herd still moving steadily on before them, and with hopes rising high because of the continued success of their march, they found themselves crossing a succession of low-lying grass-covered hills. As they reached the crest of the highest of these, and arrived at a place where they could get an unrestricted view of the tundra that lay beyond, an exclamation escaped Marion's lips. "'A forest!' she exclaimed. "'A real Arctic forest!' echoed Patsy. "'Won't it be wonderful?' "'Wonderful and dangerous,' Marion replied. "'Unless I miss my guess, here is where our troubles begin. "'It may not be so bad, though,' she quickly amended, "'as she saw the look of fear that came over her cousin's face. "'That forest is fully ten miles away. "'The sun is about to set. "'We'll drive our herd down into the tundra, where there is plenty of moss. "'We'll camp there and get up for an early start in the morning. "'The forest may be only a narrow belt along a river.' Marian did not feel very sure that her predictions would prove true, but she was the sort of person who measures all perils carefully, then hopes for the best. Two hours later they were eating a meal of reindeer stew and hot biscuits, which had been cooked over the willow wood fire in their Yukon stove. Then, as they chatted of the future, Marian held up a finger for silence. "'What was that?' she whispered. "'A shot?' "'I didn't. Yes, yes, there's another. Marion was up and out of the tent in an instant. As her eyes swept the horizon, they caught a gleam of light from the hills above, the red and yellow light of a campfire. With one sweeping glance, she took in the position of her herd. She had just noted that a certain brown deer had strayed some distance up the hill. She was about to suggest to Terragluna, who had also been called from his tent by the shots, that he send a dog after the deer, when, to her great astonishment, she caught a flash of light, heard a sharp report, then saw the brown deer crumple up like an empty sack and drop to the snow. For one instant she stood there, as if in a trance. Then, with a quick turn, she said, Patsy, you stay with Atatak. Terragluna, you come with me. Turning, she walked straight toward the spot where the reindeer had fallen. The faithful Terragluna, in spite of his fear of the Indians of the little sticks, followed at her heels. When they arrived at the spot, they found a man bending over the dead deer. In his hands was the rifle that had sped the bullet. The soft-soled mucklucks that Marion and Terragluna wore made no sound on the snow. The man's back was towards them, and they came upon him unobserved. The powerful Terragluna would have leaped upon his back and thrown him to the snow, but Marion held him back. Stranger, said the girl, in as steady a voice as she could, why did you kill our deer? Like a flash, the man gripped his rifle as he wheeled about. Then, seeing it was a girl who spoke, he lowered his weapon. Marion's eyes took him in with one feeling glance. His face was haggard, emaciated. His hands were mere skin and bones. He was an Indian. Too hungry, he murmured. No come caribou, no come ptarmigan, no fish in the river, no rabbits on the tundra. He spread out his bony hands in a gesture of despair. But you needn't have killed him. Had you come to us, we would have given you meat, all you could use. The girl's face was frank and fearless. Yet there was a certain huskiness in her voice that as the sensitive ears of the Indian betokened kindness. Yes, he said slowly, maybe you would. Yesterday we saw other reindeer herd, north maybe ten miles. Want deer, ask man, big man, much whiskers. Say want food. Man said, get out. Want to kill me if I not go quick. Bad man, that one. We go away. Then see your herd, say, take one deer. You want to fight? Then fight. Better to die by bullet than by hunger. The man you saw, said Marion, her heart sinking as she realized that he must be a half day in the lead, was Bill Scarberry. Yes, he is a mean man. But see, have you a cache, some place where you can keep meat from the wolves and wolverines? Yes, yes, exclaimed the Indian eagerly. Ten miles, Diesa River, a cabin. How many deer must you have to keep you until game comes? Maybe, maybe, the Indian stared at her in astonishment. Maybe two, maybe three. All right, said Marion. You have killed a fine doe. 
That was bad, but I forgive you. She held out her hand to grasp the native's bony fingers. Now, she said briskly, since you have killed her, you may keep the meat. Terragluna, she turned to the Eskimo, point out two young bucks, the best we have. Tell him he may kill them, and that he and his friends may take them to their cabin. I, I, the Indian attempted to speak. Failing utterly, he turned and walked a few steps away, then turning, struck straight away toward the spot where the red and yellow campfire gleamed. That is his camp? asked Marion. Terragluna nodded silently. They will come for the meat, and will give us no further trouble? Eh, eh, smiled the Eskimo. The daughter of my master has acted wisely. The man who starves, he is different. These reindeer, he waved his arms toward the herd, they belong to my master and his daughter. When men are not starving, yes. When men are starving, no. To the starving all things belong. Bill Scarberry, he remember yet. Indian of little sticks, they never forget. As Marion turned to retrace her steps to camp, she chanced to glance up at the other camp, where, but an hour before, she had seen the flash of the purple flame. It was closer than she thought. The flash of flame was gone, but she was sure she caught the outlines of a tent, surer still that she saw a solitary figure atop a nearby knoll, sitting as if on watch. This solitary man held a rifle across his knees. I wonder why he is there, she said to herself. I wonder why they are following us. Oh, she breathed as she walked towards the camp. It's so tantalizing, that purple flame and all. I have half a notion to take Terragluna, as I did with that Indian, and march right up to them and demand the meaning of their mysterious actions. As if intending to turn this thought into action at once, she stopped and turned about. To her surprise, as she looked toward the crest of the hill, she saw the solitary watcher was gone. Oh, well, she sighed. We have no real reason for invading their camp. We've no proof that they've ever done us any harm, except perhaps the time that Patsy saw the blood trail and the antler marks in the snow. It seems that it must have been our deer, but we never could prove it. Glancing away at a more distant hill crest, she was surprised at the picture revealed there. The moon, just rising from behind the hill, threw out in bold relief the broad spreading antlers of a magnificent creature of the wilderness. Old Omnapook, said Marian, what do you think of that? We have travelled five days, and yet we are still in the company of the mysterious camp followers of the Purple Flame and Old Omnapook, the caribou reindeer. Who has haunted the outskirts of our camp so long i suppose she said thoughtfully that i should tell terogluna to have the indians kill omnampook that would save one of our reindeers and besides if we let him live who knows but that at some critical moment he may rush in and assume the leadership of our herd and lead them to disaster or lose them to us forever i have heard of that happening with horses and cattle why not with reindeer and yet, she sighed, I can't quite make up my mind to do it. He is such a wonderful fellow. The time was to come, and that was very soon, when she was to rejoice because of this decision. End of chapter 24recording by lynn thompson chapter 25 the mirage that night marian lay awake for a long time she had a vague feeling that they were approaching a crisis many agencies were at work some feared to favor the success of their enterprise and some were working directly against them scarberry with his herd was some hours ahead of them that was bad if he succeeded in retaining this lead the race was lost however less than half the distance had been covered the easiest half many a peril awaited each herd who could tell when prowling wolves large bands of indians a caribou herd an impassable river might bring either to a halt marian could not answer all of the questions that troubled her 
the indians would they be satisfied with her gift of food or would they continue to prey upon her herd would they go back to some large tribe and lead them to the herd that they might drive them away an easy bounty she had dealt with the eskimos knew about what to expect from them but indians she whispered to herself what are they like as if in answer to her perplexity there came to her mind the words of a great and good man humanity is everywhere very much the same this thought gave her comfort she could not help but feel that the indian she had befriended would not betray her but might even come to her aid in some emergency but those of the purple flame she whispered to herself that silent watcher on the hill what did he mean by sitting there with a rifle across his knee is he and his companions our friends or our enemies here indeed was a problem until this day she had felt that these persons were to be distrusted and feared however there had been something about that silent watcher that had given her a feeling of safety in spite of her prejudice it was as if he was set there as a watch to see that the indian did us no harm she told herself and yet how could he it was in the midst of this perplexity that she fell asleep long before dawn the girls awoke to face a new day and a new unknown peril the forest stretching out black and sombre against the white foreground of snow seemed a great menacing hand reaching out to seize their precious possession they could not know what perils awaited them in the forest with breakfast over the tent struck sled deer harnessed and hitched to the sled and everything in readiness for the continuing of the race to fort jarvis the girls climbed the nearest hill hoping that they might catch some glimpse of the country beyond the forest their hopes were in vain far as the eye could see the forest stretched before them they could only guess the miles they must travel before coming again to rolling hills and level tundra they were traveling over a region of the great northland which had never really been explored no accurate map showed where rivers ran or forests spread out over the plains standing there looking at the great forest patsy quoted this the forest primeval the murmuring pines and the hemlocks stand like druids of old with beards that rest on their bosom and with two eskimos for companions we are to enter that forest only wild people and wilder caribou and wolves have been there before us oh marion we are explorers we really truly are isn't it grand marion did not answer there was a puzzled look on her face as she stared away toward the north out of the very clouds faint images appeared to be marching yes yes now they became clearer reindeer a whole herd of them what could it mean was this a vision was she seeing things or was it possible that much higher hills lay over there and that the reindeer were crossing them look she said to her cousin pointing away to the clouds together with bated breaths they watched the panorama that moved before them now they saw the herders and their dogs saw them run this way and that saw the herd change its course saw the herders again take up the steady march why exclaimed patsy seems as if you could hear the crack crack of reindeer hoofs and the bark of the dogs they must be miles away it's the scarberry herd said marion look whispered patsy the deer are stopping it was true having come to an abrupt halt as if facing an insurmountable barrier the leaders compelled those that followed to pack in a solid mass behind them or to spread out to right or left in an incredibly short time they stood out in a straight line facing east it it must be a river a river that is still open that cannot be crossed said marion in tones of tense excitement and that means exclaimed patsy that our rival has been stopped nature has brought them to a halt we may win yet let's hurry we may find a crossing place in the forest but look look over there to the left cried patsy what where why they're gone exclaimed patsy there were three men indians they looked like they seemed to be watching the scarberry herd from a hilltop some distance away 
but look cried marion it's gone to their great astonishment the herd had vanished as it had appeared to march out of the cloud so it seemed now to have receded again into them were we dreaming patsy asked in an awed whisper no said marion thoughtfully it was a mirage a mirage of the great white wilderness we have them here just as they do in the desert by the aid of this mirage nature has shown us a great secret that we still have a splendid chance to win the race let's get down to camp and be away but the three indians questioned patsy what were they about to do who knows said marion we have little to do with the scarberry herd our task is that of getting to fort jarvis two hours were consumed in reaching the edge of the forest after that for hours they passed through the wonder world of a northern forest in winter deep and still the snow lay like a great white blanket black as ebonite against this whiteness stood the fir and spruce trees there was something strangely solemn about the place the crack of reindeer hoofs the bark of dogs all seemed strangely out of place here it was as though they stood on holy ground it's like a church patsy said in an awed voice god's great cathedral answered marian fortunately the trees were not too close together there was room for the deer to pass between them so as before the herd moved forwardly in a fairly compact mass going to be easy was patsy's comment after three hours had passed i don't know marian shook her head in doubt i hope so but you know an alaskan who is used to barren hills and tundra dreads the forest i belong to the tundra so i dread it too in spite of her fears just at nightfall marian found herself passing from beneath the last spruce tree and gazing away at rolling hills beyond she was just offering up a little prayer of thanksgiving when some movement of the forward herd leaders attracted her attention they're stopping she said i wonder why instantly the vision of the morning flashed through her mind the river she exclaimed in alarm if if we can't cross it we'll have to camp at the edge of the forest and that is bad very bad animals that are cowards and slink away by day become daring beasts of prey at night a hurried race forward confirmed her worst suspicions there at her feet was a river flanked on one side by willows and on the other by a steep bank it was not a broad stream she could throw a stone across it but it did flow swiftly its powerful current had thus far defied the winter's fiercest blast it was full to the brim with milky water and crowding cakes of ice no creature could brave that torrent and live blocked she cried and just when i was hoping for so much sinking down upon the snow she gave herself over for a moment of hopeless despair the next moment she was on her feet with arms outstretched toward the stars as if in an appeal for aid she spoke through tight clenched teeth we must we will we will win as if in mockery of her high resolves at that moment there came to her ears the long-drawn howl of a timber wolf the call of the wolf was answered by another and yet another at the moment they seemed some distance away but marian trembled at the sound a wolf travels fast she told herself as she turned to hurry back to patsy and her faithful eskimo listen she exclaimed as she came near to her companions sounds like ten or twelve of them howling at once terragluna do wolves travel in packs maybe not the eskimo shrugged his shoulders but often they are many then they call to one another they come all to one place then there's trouble there will be trouble tonight and we have no rifle we he broke off abruptly to lean forward in a listening attitude that is strange he murmured they have found some prey back there where they are perhaps a caribou as they stood at strained attention it became evident to all that the creature being pursued was coming down the wind toward them the yap yap of the wolves now in full pursuit grew momentarily louder at the beginning they had seemed two miles away now they seemed but one mile a half mile the girls fairly held their breaths as they watched and waited 
and now it seemed that the wolves must be all but upon them then with a sudden cry marion saw the great spreading antlers of old omnapook the king of reindeer and caribou rise above the ridge he's not alone there are others patsy breathed reindeer marion murmured in astonishment it was true one by one at first then by fives and tens a drove of deer fifty or sixty in number appeared on the crest of the hill and came plunging down toward marion's herd the old monarch had never before joined their herd but this time without a second's hesitation he plunged straight on until he came to the edge of the herd then with a peculiar whistled challenge he wheeled about and with antlers lowered for battle poured defiance at the onrushing band of wolves then a strange and interesting drama began to be enacted there was a shifting and turning of deer front ranks were quickly formed when the wolves with lolling tongues and dripping jaws reached the spot they found themselves facing a solid row of bayonet-like antlers quick as they were to understand the situation and to rush away in a circle to execute a rear attack the deer under the monarch's leadership were quicker other lines were formed until a complete circle of antlers confronted the beasts of prey the weaker and younger deer were in the center then it was that the girls discovered for the first time that they too were in the center that they were surrounded by the restless snorting pawing herd of deer in their interest at watching the progress of events they had not been aware of the fact that the deer in swinging about had encircled them that they were in peril they knew all too well they read this in the look of concern on terragluna's face circle hold all right he said soberly not hold bad deer afraid go mad want to trample down all want to get away fast maybe knock down my master's daughter her friend terragluna at attack knock down all maybe trampled maybe die maybe wolf kick there was apparently nothing to do but wait to the wolf pack new numbers appeared to be added from time to time the sound of their yap yapping came incessantly the circle swayed now to this side and now to that as some frightened deer appeared ready to break away it was with the utmost difficulty that the girls prevented themselves from being knocked down and trampled under the sharp hoofs of the surging deer what will it be like if the circle breaks and they really stampede groaned patsy for the first time in her arctic experience she was truly frightened i don't know answered marian we can only trust i wish we were out of this i wish a sharp exclamation escaped marian's lips over to the left a deer had gone down the wolves appeared to have cut the tendons to his forelegs there was a terrible confusion it seemed that the day was lost that the stampede was at hand keep close to me marian whispered bravely some way we will pull through patsy gripped her arm for the final struggle then to her astonishment she heard the sound of a shot then another and yet another someone to our rescue cried marian who can it be end of chapter 25chapter 26 of the purple flame by roy j snell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 26 the mysterious deliverer accustomed as they were to the presence of men the reindeer not at all frightened by the shots held their position in the impregnable circle the cowardly wolves began to slink away at the first shot it seemed no time at all until the only sound to be heard was the rattle of antlers as the deer broke ranks and began to scatter again for feeding some moments before the girls could make their way out of the centre of the herd the firing ceased who could it have been patsy asked don't know said marian whoever it was we must find them and thank them this task she found to be more difficult than she had supposed there had doubtless been tracks left by the strange deliverer, but these had already been trampled by the deer. Search as they might, they could find no trace of the person who had fired the shots. 
mute testimony of his skill as a marksman two dead wolves lay on the snow close to the spot where the defensive circle had been formed what did you make of that marion asked at last in great bewilderment terragluna where could they have gone canoctimana i don't know terragluna shook his head soberly one of marion's sleds had been left at the edge of the forest upon returning to this they experienced another great surprise lying across the sled was a rifle and in a pile beside it were five boxes of cartridges a rifle exclaimed marion seizing it and drawing it from its leather sheath a beauty and a new one the two girls sat down on the sled and stared at one another in speechless silence terragluna and attatak soon joined them it was the indian the one we saved from starving exclaimed patsy at last i just know it was terragluna shook his head old rifle may be all right he mumbled new rifle maybe indian not give the girls not at all convinced that this conclusion was a correct one still clung to the belief that their protector had been the indian since it was impossible to cross the river it was decided that they should make camp at the edge of the forest that terragluna with the rifle was to keep watch over the herd the first part of the night and marion who was a good shot the latter half it was while marion was packing away the dishes after supper that the piece of old ivory with the ancient engraving on it the newest piece which they had found in the mountain cave fell out of her sleeping bag without knowing it she had saved this the least of their treasures look she said to terragluna who sat cross-legged before the fire we found this in a mountain cave what does it say surely you can read it for a long time terragluna studied the crude picture in silence when at last he spoke it was to inform her that the ivory had once belonged to his great uncle that it told of a very successful hunt in which twenty caribou had been driven into a trap and killed with bows and arrows that shortly after that they had come upon a white man with a long beard starving in a cabin beside a stream they had given the man caribou meat he had grown strong then gone away as pay for their kindness he had offered them heavy yellow pebbles and dust from a moose hide sack this they had not taken because they did not know what it was good for they had asked two cups and a knife instead as he explained this the eskimo showed each picture that told the part of the story narrated it seems very real said marion how long ago could it have been maybe twenty years said terragluna the white man was a prospector and the yellow pebbles and dust must have been gold exclaimed patsy oh marion if we could find that place we'd be rich terragluna could you find the place again the eskimo studied the ancient picture writing eh eh he said at last maybe could oh marion we'll go back said patsy doing a wild dance on her sleeping bag we'll go back for gold for the present said marion quietly we have work enough we must get our herd to fort jarvis looks as if that will be a difficult enough task but tell me she turned suddenly to terragluna there were more than fifty reindeer with old omnap pook were there not yes where did they come from my master's herd they are the deer we have been missing all winter the ones we thought had been killed yes why then she leaped suddenly to her feet in her excitement then those people cannot have killed our deer at all no not kill then why did they follow us are they following us now what was it they killed that night if not our deer oh it's too perplexing for words terragluna looked at her and smiled a droll smile many strange things on hill and tundra some time maybe no maybe not terragluna must go watch you sleep tomorrow may be very hard taking up the rifle he left the tent before creeping into her sleeping bag marion stepped out of the tent to cool her heated brow in the crisp night air above her the stars gleamed like tiny campfires beyond her the dark forest loomed from the distance she caught the bump and grind of ice crowding the banks of the river 
Morning came and with it the problem of crossing the river they had been traveling by compass as far as Marion could tell to go either up or down the river would be to go out of their direct path Terragluna advised going north some signs intelligible to the girls but clear enough to him appeared to promise a crossing two or three miles above For once the canny instincts of the Eskimo failed He was no longer in his own land of barren hills tundra and sea Perhaps this caused him to err one thing was certain as they traveled northward the hills that lined the stream grew more rugged and rocky and the river more turbulent We won't find a crossing for miles Marion said with a tone of conviction Even Terragluna paused to ponder and scratch his head It was just at the moment when despair appeared about to take possession of them that Patsy chancing to glance away at the hills That loomed above the opposite banks suddenly cried look a man all looked in the same direction she had pointed the man was standing perfectly still but his right hand was pointing like a wooden signboard it pointed downstream three times the arm dropped three times it was raised to point again he is an indian said terragluna stoically it is his country he knows we must go back the crossing lies in that direction as the man on the hill saw them turn their herd about and start back he began to travel slowly downstream All that day and even into the night he went before them showing the way Like a pillar of fire said Marion with a little choke in her voice There was no doubt in her mind that this benefactor was the Indian they had befriended when he was starving To her lips there came a line she had long known I was hungered and ye gave me meat Not wishing to camp again at the edge of the forest. They traveled without rest or food for eight hours At last when they were so hungry and weary that they felt they must drop in their tracks and fall asleep They came suddenly to a place where the troubled rush of waters ceased Where the river spread out into a broad quiet ice-bound lake Thank God Marion murmured reverently as she dropped exhausted upon her sled after resting and eating a cold lunch of hardtack frozen boiled beans and reindeer steak they headed the herd across the lake having passed through the narrow forest that skirted the lake they came upon a series of low-lying barren hills here in a little gully lined with willows whose clinging dead leaves rustled incessantly in the breeze the girls made camp before going to sleep marian walked out into the night to view her herd the sky was clear the golden moon made the night light as day The herd was resting peacefully She wondered vaguely if other human beings might be near their mysterious guide had left them at the shore of the lake at No time had he come close enough to be identified She was wondering about him and as her gaze swept the horizon. She saw the red and yellow gleam of a campfire her feeling toward that campfire had changed there had been a time when it filled her with fear now as she gazed steadily at it It seemed a star of hope a protecting fire that was perhaps to go with them all their long journey through The Indians camp I suppose and yet she asked herself is it it might be the tent of the purple flame And if it is do they mean us good or ill? Sleep that night was long and refreshing they awoke next morning with renewed courage before them lay great sweeping stretches of tundra For days without a single new adventure they pushed on toward Fort Jarvis Sometimes beside a campfire of willows Marion sat wondering how they were coming on with their race Were Scarberry and his herd nearer the fort than they there was no way to tell Traveling the trackless Arctic wilderness is like sailing the boundless sea as a thousand ships might pass you by night or day so a thousand herds taking other courses might pass this one on its way to fort jarvis and no owner know of the others passing sometimes too she thought of those mysterious camp followers the people of the purple flame she no longer feared them was curious about them that was all no longer did she catch the gleam of their light by night had they turned aside gone back or had they merely extinguished their unusual light 
The Indians, she thought, must have been left behind. They would not travel far from their hunting ground. They had been served, and had served in turn. Now they might safely be forgotten. Then there came a time that called for all the courage and endurance their natures could command. One night they found themselves camped among the foothills of a range of mountains. The mountains, a row of alternating triangles of deep purple and light yellow, lay away to the east, and at their peaks the snow, tossed high in air by the incessant gales that blew there, made each peak seem a smoking volcano. Tomorrow, said Terragluna, throwing out his hand in a sweeping gesture, we must cross. Is there no other way? asked Patsy. Must do, said Terragluna, as he hurried to the task of putting all in readiness. Two o'clock in the afternoon on the following day found them engaged in a terrific battle with the blizzard that ever raged up the mountain pass which they must cross. Try not the pass, the old man said. The storm is lowering overhead, Patsy chanted bravely as, with snow-encrusted head and with cheeks that must be rubbed incessantly to prevent them from freezing, she struggled forward. A moment later, as a fiercer shock seemed about to lift her from her feet and hurl her down the mountainside, Marion heard her fairly shriek into the teeth of the gale, Excelsior! Excelsior! Many hard battles had Marion fought out on the tundra, but nothing had ever equalled this. The snow, seeming never to stop, shot past them, or in a wild whirling eddy dashed into their faces. The wind tore at them. Now it came in rude gusts, and now poured down some narrow pass with all the force of a waterfall. Only by bending low and leaping into it could they make any progress. The herd plunged stumblingly forward in a broad line. The dogs, incessantly at their heels, urged them forward. Terragluna and even the brave Atatak did all in their power to keep the herd moving. If they stop, oh, if they do, panted Marion, if they refuse to go on, we are lost. If only we reach the summit, I am sure we will be safe. It must be calm on the other side. Now Gold, the master collie, completely exhausted and blinded by the snow, came slinking back to his mistress. Marion rubbed the snow from the eyes of the faithful dog and, patting his side, bade him go back into the fight. Tears came to her eyes as the dog bravely returned to his task. The time came at last when all three dogs seemed done in. When the deer all but stopped, when it seemed impossible that they might be kept moving another five minutes. Then it was that the indomitable Marion sank down upon her sled in the depths of despair. Look, look, cried Patsy, who had turned about to rub the frost from her cheeks. Wolves, a whole pack of them. Marion wheeled about for one look, then, digging into her pack, drew forth the rifle. We'll die fighting, she murmured, as she took steady aim at the foremost member of the pack that came tearing up the trail. She was about to press the trigger when Patsy gave her arm a sudden pull. Wait, she cried. Wait, those are not wolves. They're dogs. Great, big, wonderful dogs. End of chapter 26Chapter 27 of The Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 27 The End of the Trail. Troops of conflicting hopes and fears waged battle in Marion's brain when she realized that the pack approaching them on the run up the trail in the teeth of the storm were not wolves but dogs. There are two types of dogs in Alaska. One, more wolf than dog, is the native wolf dog. This type, once he is loosed, leaps at the throat of the first reindeer he sees. A pack of these dogs, in such a crisis as the girls were now facing, would not only destroy many of the feebly struggling, worn-out and helpless younger deer, but beyond doubt would drive the remainder of the herd into such a wild panic as would lose them to their owners for ever. Were the dogs of this, or the other type, white men's dogs, who treat the reindeer as they might cattle or sheep, and merely bark at them and drive them forward. If they were white men's dogs, they might save the day, 
for the barking of such a pack as fresh for the struggle as they appeared to be would doubtless drive the exhausted deer to renewed efforts and carry them on over the top with bated breath and trembling heart marian watched their approach once hope fell as she thought she caught the sharp key of a wolf dog in this she must have been mistaken for as they came closer she saw that they were magnificent shaggy coated fellows with an unmistakable collie strain in their blood oh she cried the chariots of the lord and the horsemen thereof it was a strange expression but fitted the occasion so well that patsy felt her heart give a great leap of joy indeed the steeds of the arctic if not the horsemen had come to their aid in a time of great need and passing them with a wild leap the dogs burst upon the deer with a rush and roar that sent them forward by leaps and bounds staggering forward the girls followed as best they could now they were a thousand yards from the summit now five hundred now three now two and now the first deer were disappearing over the top enheartened by this the others crowded forward until with one final rush they all passed over the top and started down on the other side just as the girls reached the crest and were peering over the summit a shrill whistle smote their ears it sounded again and yet again there was a movement just before them then the snow-covered pack of dogs rushed pell-mell past them on the back trail downhill someone whistled to them they are going back how wonderfully they must be trained exclaimed patsy they were someone's team marian said slowly as if for the first time realizing that they had not really been sent direct from heaven to save them they're somebody's team he knew we were in trouble and turned the dogs loose to help us i wonder who he could have been for the present the question remained unanswered the herd had gone on before them it was all important that they join them so having straightened out the draw straps to their sleds they began making their way down the hard packed and uncertain descent it was not long before they came upon the herd feeding on a little mountain plateau terogluna was already busy making camp and attatak thawing out food over a fire of tiny scrub fir trees isn't it wonderful to think that the great struggle is over whispered marian contentedly as they lounged on their sleeping bags an hour later this is really the worst of it i hope fort jarvis can't be more than four days away now over a smoother down trail if only we are in time sighed patsy we must be oh we must be exclaimed marian passionately surely it will be too much to struggle as we have and then lose before marian fell asleep she set her mind to meet any outcome of their adventure she thought of the wonderful opportunities the sale of the herd would bring to her father and herself near some splendid school they must rent a bungalow there she would keep house for him and go to school in her mind she saw the wonderful roses that bloomed around their doorstep and pictured the glorious sunsets they would view from their back door perhaps too she told herself patsy could live with us for a year or two and attend my school when she had pictured all this she saw in her mind that the race had been lost that scarberry had sold his herd to the canadian officials that she was to turn the heads of her leading reindeer toward the home tundra with great difficulty at first but with ever increasing enthusiasm in her imagination she drove the herd all the way back to enter once more upon the wild free life of the herder it really does not matter she told herself it's really only for father he is so lonely down there all by himself in her heart of hearts she knew that it did matter mattered a very great deal indeed brave girl that she was she only prepared her mind for the shock that would come if the race were really lost four days later the two girls found themselves approaching a small village of log cabins and long low-lying buildings this was fort jarvis they had made the remainder of the journey in safety leaving their herd some ten miles from the fort where the deer would be safe they had tramped in on snowshoes marian found her heart fluttering painfully as her feet fell in the hard packed village path had scarberry been there was the race lost had the man of the purple flame been there had he anything to do with the deal 
Twice they asked directions of passing Indians. At last they knocked at a door. The door swung open, and they found themselves inside a long, low room. At a table close to an open fire sat a man in uniform. He rose and bowed as they came toward him. You, you are the agent for the Canadian government? Marion faltered, addressing the man in uniform. The man nodded his head and smiled a little welcome. You wish to buy a reindeer herd? Marion asked the question point blank. I believe, the man answered quietly, that I have already agreed to purchase one. You, you, Marion sank to a chair. The shock was too much. You see, the truth is, smiled the Major, as though there had been no interruption, I believe I have agreed to purchase your herd. My herd? exclaimed Marion, unable to believe her ears. But how did you know of my herd? How did you know I was on the way? Who told you? One question at a time, young lady, laughed the Major. I think I have a number of surprises for you. As to your first question, I will say that I have never heard of your herd until two days ago. That day, two days after the great storm, a half-famished Indian reached Fort Jarvis, driving a splendid team of white men's dogs. They had been hard driven. After we had fed him, he jerkily told the story of your race against a man named Scarberry. He told us of the treatment you had given him, of your kindness to his people. Then he told of Scarberry, told how Scarberry's herd had been delayed and held up along the trail, and how he had tried to be of help to you. Then he told of your battle against the storm, and how, once you were safely over the pass, he had driven night and day to reach here. His hope was to get here ahead of any other herd and intercede for you. Such loyalty is not to be denied, and I told him that should your herd reach here in good shape, that I would give it preference, even should Scarberry get here ahead of you. I believe that answers one of your questions. But how in the world did this Indian know that the government had agreed to purchase a herd? asked Marion. In the north, answered the Major, rumour flies fast, even over seemingly uninhabited places. And you may depend upon it that the Indian will know what is going on, even if he does have but little to say. Now, to business. I understand you have brought the herd with you. Yes, answered Marion. They are at our camp about ten miles out. Then we may consider the deal closed. There remains but to count the deer, to weed out those that are too old or too weak for the final drive, then to make out your order on our government. We have Lapland herders who will assist in the work. You may rest here with us until the count is completed. After that, I will see that you have guides and dog teams for the passage south to the railhead. Oh, how wonderful! exclaimed Patsy, impulsively leaping to her feet. But Bill Scarberry, she asked suddenly, did he really win? No, smiled the Major. He has not yet been heard from. So you won the race after all. Good, exclaimed Patsy. I could never have been happy again if we had lost, even if Marion did sell her herd. After a night's rest at the post, Marion and Patsy felt like they had come into a new life. They had lain awake long into the night, exchanging excited whispers over their good luck. The next morning, as Marion was passing down the street, she noticed a dog team. There was something about the leader that looked familiar. One glance at the driver brought an exclamation of surprise to her lips. He was none other than the Indian she had saved from starvation, and who in turn had served as her guardian angel. That is the dog team that came to our rescue in the blizzard, was her mental comment. While she had been told the rest of the story by the Major, she preferred to have the story from the man's own lips. She found him very reluctant to talk, but after his heart had been warmed by a splendid meal of boiled reindeer meat and coffee, he told his story from the time she had given him three of her reindeer until the present moment. Shortly after leaving her, he had come in with some of his own people who were well fed and prosperous. Knowing that the girls were headed straight for trouble and feeling very grateful to them, he had persuaded one of these, his kinsmen, to go with him and to follow the reindeer herd with his team of white men's dogs. 
It had been they who had driven the wolf pack away and had left a rifle and ammunition for the girls. It was their dog team that had been released from the sled and had assisted in driving the reindeer herd over the mountain. But why did you do all this? Marion asked. The man looked at her for a moment in silence. Then he asked, Why did you give reindeer? Because you were in need. And you, a faint smile played across his face, you too were in need. Indian all same white man. Then Marion understood, and her heart was filled with a new love for all those strange people who inhabit the white wilderness. The next day, Marion and Patsy, together with the Major and his Lapland herders, went out to Marion's camp, and there began the business of sorting and counting the deer. This work continued for three days, and on the evening of the third day, leaving the herd in charge of the Lapland herders, Marion, Patsy, and the Major, together with Terogluna and Atatak, started for Fort Jarvis by way of deer sled. Topping a hill some two miles from Fort Jarvis, they suddenly came upon a tent. Just before they reached it, the interior became suddenly lighted with a strange purple flame. Marion halted her deer with an exclamation of surprise. The purple flame, she gasped, and turning to the Major said, I can stand this mystery no longer. Do you know who is in that tent? Why, yes, I think so, said the Major. I think it is Mr. Montgomery, an old prospector. He is well known throughout the north. Why do you ask? I want to meet him, said Marion. Will you please come with me to his tent? A moment later, a hearty old man came to the door of the tent in response to their call, and with a cheery smile, acknowledged the Major's introduction of Marion and Patsy, at once inviting them in. Imagine Marion's surprise when, upon entering the tent, she saw a young girl of about her own age, seated at the radio sending set and there under the deft fingers of the girl operator a crackling purple flash jumped back and forth across a wide spark gap the girl of the purple flame gasped patsy at sound of her voice the girl turned around and smiled a welcome marian turned to mr montgomery so you are the people of the purple flame are we indeed laughed the old prospector Yes, said Marion, and I thought all the while back there in Alaska that you were dogging our footsteps, and, to speak honestly, we feared you. Well, well, laughed the old gentleman, so that was your reindeer camp. We thought all the while that you were dogging our footsteps. Then the old prospector launched into a long story that cleared up the entire mystery of the purple flame. It appeared that in his youth he had been a prospector in Alaska, and had found a very rich vein of gold. Ill health had overtaken him, and he had been forced to return to the States. Years passed, and fortune and wealth had come to him, but the lure of searching for gold was still in his veins, and in the end he had come again to Alaska, thinking to find his mine. The years had somewhat dimmed his memory, and he had searched in vain for the lost mine. Moving from day to day, he had been just as surprised to note that Marion's camp moved with him, as was Marion to discover that his camp moved with hers. In time he had become suspicious, fearing that they were dogging his footsteps. He knew that he had been well known throughout the North in the past, and he feared that others knew of his lost mine. And that, concluded Mr. Montgomery, is the reason I never called at your camp. And that radio set, said Marion, with its flash of purple flame, is the reason that I never called at your camp. There was something so mysterious about it all. The old prospector smiled. I suppose, he said, that my having a sending and receiving radio set is a bit strange and perhaps a little mysterious. Certainly the set is a bit strange, for to my knowledge there is not another set like it in the country. It is very compact and yet most powerful. You see, my interests in the outside are very extensive, and it is necessary for me to keep in touch with them. By the use of this set, I can keep in touch with my agent in Nome, and he in turn can keep in touch with the States by use of the cable. It was the spark of my set while sending that made the purple-coloured flash which kept you so mystified. You know, 
most mysterious things become quite simple when you find out all about them this radio has made it possible for me to come back and look for my lost mine it's the lure of the thing that draws me not the desire for the gold and then it was that marian remembering the treasures that she had found in the cave on the enchanted mountain and feeling that she had something in common with this old prospector told him her story as she told of the carved ivory the old man's eyes glowed with delight and in the end he insisted that he go into fort jarvis with them that he might at least see the piece they had brought along and hear terragluna's story at the post old terragluna in a halting way read the pictured inscription on the four sides other bits of information furnished by terragluna convinced the old prospector that terragluna's great uncle had been his guide in the days when he was first prospecting and had found the mine mr montgomery wanted to set out at once with terragluna and attatak for the cave on the mountain why he exclaimed that's very near my lost mine for i remember that my old guide terragluna's great uncle spoke of the cave as a place where we might winter in safety should winter come down upon us before we expected it how wonderful said marian we have just completed the count and sale of our deer patsy and i are going back to the states and i am sure terragluna and attatak will go with you and you will be in good hands she added giving both of the faithful servants a glowing smile the sale of the deer was successfully completed after a much-needed rest the girls began the long journey to the outside so far were they from the strange cabin of the recluse musician they were unable to return for the treasure they had taken from the mountain cave many months passed and then one day as the two girls returned from an afternoon of shopping in chicago marian found a registered package awaiting her from its bulk and from the many postmarks upon it she knew at once that it contained the long-awaited ancient treasure her fingers trembled as she undid the many wrappings when at last she came to the treasure she found each piece separately wrapped the copper instruments and the old ivory pieces were just as she had found them tarnished and blackened with age but what is this she held up before patsy's astonished eyes a green bowl which gleamed in the light like a crystal why exclaimed patsy as she saw her cousin unpack another and another and yet another he has thought your old dishes were useless and has sent you some of his exquisite glassware instead how strange murmured marian ready to cry with disappointment she had hoped to surprise mr cole the curator of the museum with rare pieces of ancient pottery such as had never before been brought from the arctic and here were only four pieces of glassware how they had ever come to be here she could not guess but here they were look cried patsy what a strange appearance they have when you hold them to the light and see two of them are blue and two are tawny green like huge cat's eyes wait said marian here is a note from our aged friend she unfolded it and read it aloud please pardon an old man's fancy i could not resist the temptation of polishing these up a bit the very sight of them makes me envious they are indeed a rare find i have a guess as to what they are made of but your friend the curator will know so exclaimed patsy they are the very dishes you found in the cave how very very strange we must have mr cole come over at once said marian half beside herself with curiosity she raced to the telephone and a moment later had the curator on the wire if you have read our other book the cruise of the omu you will remember that marian with her two friends lucille and florence had once made a rare find for the museum so you will not wonder that so great a man should hurry right over in answer to their call when he arrived marian placed one of the bowls in his hands with a single comment from a cave in a mountain in alaska for three minutes he turned the bowl about before the light what do you want me to tell you about it there was a strange light in his eye almost everything exclaimed marian what's it made of who made it how long ago how wait a bit not so fast the curator held up a hand for silence you should know what it's made of 
he smiled. What was the blue god made of? Jade. And this? Is that jade too? Blue and green jade. Then, then the bowls should be valuable. Quite decidedly. As for your other questions, much more information is needed before we can know who made them and when. So far as I know, nothing of this kind has ever before been discovered. Were there any other pieces? Marion held out a handful of ivory pieces. For ten minutes there was silence in the room, save for the click of specimens as the curator turned them over. Then, turning suddenly, Mr. Cole put out his hands to the girls. I want to congratulate you, he said, his eyes gleaming, upon your good fortune in discovering the finest collection of specimens ever brought from Alaska. From its discoloration, this ivory should be at least five hundred years old. The bowls are doubtless of the same period. That makes them priceless. On hearing these words, Marion's joy knew no bounds. As for Patsy, her unselfish pleasure in the success of her cousin was quite as great as if it had been she who had made the find. It was arranged that Mr. Cole should take charge of the specimens, and should advise Marion in regard to their disposal. Marion's dream came true. She and her father secured the bungalow, rosebush and all, and owned it free from debt. There was money enough left for her education. As for Patsy, she was glad enough to hurry back to rejoin her classmates in Louisville, Kentucky. An unfortunate part of having plenty of money is that it is likely to shut out from one's life the thrills that come with a struggle for an existence. For the time being, Marion's life lost most of its thrills. Not so, however, with her friend Lucille Tucker. You will remember her from reading The Blue Envelope, The Cruise of the Omu, and The Secret Mark. Life for her continued to have thrills aplenty. Our next book, The Crimson Thread, will have to do with the adventures which came to her during a Christmas vacation. If you think that two weeks' time can contain but few adventures, this book will prove that you are mistaken. End of chapter 27 End of The Purple Flame by Roy J. Snell Read by Lynn Thompson in the Willamette Valley.